welcome friends to this mini workshop short one day workshop on the theme of love love as the bridge bridge between the external self and the internal reality the bridge between the illusion of this universe and the reality of our higher self this being a workshop we will try and make it an experiential affair so that we get some personal insight into what i have been talking about all these years when we talk about going within we should also experience what is going within therefore today's workshop will be devoted more to experimenting personally meditating personally trying to find the space to find the direction which helps us to understand our own higher self in this workshop are there any participants who have practiced meditation as an art of going within to their own self if so please raise your hands thank you so it will be an easy job for me seeing so many of you are already on the path when we talk of going within the first question is within what the answer is going within your own self then the next question is what is the self then the answer is the self is what we feel is the self what we know is the self what do we feel is our self this physical body in which we are operating as a conscious being therefore going within the self to start with means going within this physical body we have to take each step separately this does not mean that in fact the physical body is the self because if the physical body were the self it would be a very limited experience for the self because the physical body is born grows up grows old dies and is finished the self does not die with it the self is indestructible the self is a stream of consciousness that uses the body temporarily while here and continues to have something else thereafter we do not want to recognize that why don't we want to recognize the continuity of the self because it introduces an element of fear we are afraid of death afraid of death of this physical body therefore we identify our existence our very being with this physical body we say when the physical body goes who knows what happens after that? this business of who knows or i don't know i am ignorant creates a fear which like all other fears prevents us from having a look at what is going on when the physical body is not there everybody is afraid of physical death we want to cling to this body because this is our own real reality we do not know anything else we would rather accept a naive explanation that we are conscious because of the physical brain that we have rather than an out of the way occult suggestion by somebody that the soul is our real self coming inhabiting this body and then going away which we do not know anything about that is why we cling to the body and as we cling to the physical body it becomes more and more difficult for us to separate our self from the physical body people who have just been led on to spiritual practice by reading of books and philosophies have had this big problem the problem was they wanted to talk of a spiritual self of a spirit and yet they could not see any other self except the physical body this dichotomy prevented them from having any experience of the truth and they remained in the intellectual concept of that philosophy that there is a spirit as if the spirit is somewhere floating around elsewhere and then there are we sitting in the physical body and somewhere the spirit is entering and going as if it is a foreign function taking place it never occurred to anybody that if the spirit is real this physical body may be just a dream created by the spirit 
it doesn't occur to us doesn't look credible that like we go to sleep at night and have a dream the self in the dream is the same conscious self which is there now in the wakeful state but in the dream creates another body that body is not real the self still is real the dreamer is still there the dreamer is there in the sleep dreaming but the body he is using in the dream is created for the purpose of the dream and when we wake up the body disappears along with the dream it is very difficult for us to accept this proposition when it comes to the wakeful state and we think this body is real when the soul floats out something would be happening to this body we should be able to look back on what is happening to this body we should see what the other people are doing it is not possible for us to imagine that this could be another waking up and the whole thing including our body disappears the self alone was always awake very hard that is why we are handicapped we are spiritually handicapped we are handicapped even to the extent of not being able to go within not knowing where to go with it so these masters and mystics who have experience of waking up at will who are in touch with real consciousness without the body at all times whenever they want they come and share their experience with us and tell us since we are trapped in this handicapped situation let us start by an assumption which is readily available to us that what we think is our self is our self till we find something else since we think our physical body is our self let us take this to be the self and then figure out is the consciousness awareness operating from inside the self or outside that means when we look at this world and perceive it and have a living experience of this world are we having this experience feeling and experiencing being inside the body or outside answer is inside the body we feel we are inside the skin inside this frame inside this body and open our eyes and open our ears and open the apertures fixed on this body to see what is happening outside therefore it is not difficult to experience the phenomenon of being inside the body as a conscious being they say good enough if you can start from that point it's good enough for the first step towards going within within the self it is good enough if you start with the first step of going within the illusion which you are taking as real which is the body it does not mean that they are taking the body to be real it only means they are very practical and understand our situation and that is why they suggest that when we want to experience going within we can start with this physical body and assume it is real once that is done then they come out with startling statements this is this little body of yours 5 6 feet 7 feet tall this is such a small body just very little width can occupy such a small space can sit on a small chair can lie on a small bed can crowd into a very small room this little body contains within itself the experience of vast spaces vast skies planets stars worlds whole kingdoms one's own total spirituality one's own past present and future one's own creator how can this little body contain all this they say go within and see that this body contains all this that the great kingdom we speak of as our real home is inside this physical body because the physical body represents the self in the physical world so it becomes very interesting to see how we can go inside the physical body and find so much space so much information so much experience taking place in the physical body where is it taking place if we want to examine the physical body and cut it open there is nothing people in medical colleges they cut the bodies i used to be interested in seeing what is the body and how does it function and i was not a medical college student but i was very keen i used to cut classes in my arts college and go and put on a doctor's gown a student's gown and stand in the 
pathology rooms and the anatomy rooms of the medical college and ultimately the, the professors in the medical college thought I was one of their students <laughs> and showed me special specimens when they would be cutting up and invited me to big surgeries. And I spent two years doing this and they never noticed I was not an enrolled student there. <laughs> but my interest was to see where is all that stuff that we hear about in this body. There is so much kingdom and so much light and, and when they used to cut the bodies, I saw nothing inside except blood and flesh and muscle and tissue and nerves. There was nothing in it. It was just the cutting an animal, like cutting a tree, like cutting something else. It was almost like you could, it looked unreal. It hardly looked to be a good vehicle for life. I used to wonder how could that piece of flesh, that piece of matter hold such a thing as consciousness, as thoughts, as ideas, as invention, as seeking, as love. How could that hold it? How could that link me together? How could a physical body have all that? I got disappointed. Therefore, when we say, let us use the physical body as a self and go within, we are obviously not talking of the material body. The material body does not contain anything. Then which body, which physical body are we talking of? When we say, let us go within our physical body, we are talking of the physical body we are experiencing which is quite different from the physical body that we can see. And what's the difference? I'll give you an example. When we are sitting in this physical body, we feel we are seeing through the eyes. If you look at a physical body separately, the eyes have very small pupils, very small two pupils on two eyeballs. And they are covered by the aqueous humor and, and uh, backed up by vitreous humor and then the cornea and all that lens system, all the refractory system enables these two little pupils with the retina or the nerve, nerves, optic nerves behind to peep out and see this world. Did you know how this is how we are seeing the world? We have got two little pinholes stuck in the body and through that we are trying to see the world. Has anybody felt like that? How do we feel? We feel that we are there we feel our head, whether we open our eyes or close our eyes. And we feel their big hollows because we can see the tip of the nose on both sides. As if we are behind somewhere and we are watching out through this head. And these are our eyes. They are so big. Have you ever noticed that? Our own experience of seeing is so different from the anatomy of seeing on a physical body. So when these masters come and explain to us, what it means to go within your physical body, they are referring to our personal experience of a physical body. In the medical school, they are taught that uh, there is a motor function. When one has to raise one's hand, the brain gives a command from a particular spot. That particular spot alone can give the command to the right hand, raise and the right hand goes up. Have you ever heard that command? Has anybody ever heard a command coming from the, a certain point in the head to the hand, hand go up and the hand goes up. You always feel you have raised your hand. There is no connection between the two. Then you raise your hand and I ask you, raise your hands. Nobody says, brain, give the instruction. And have you ever noticed that any particular spot in the brain is functioning to do that? Have you ever had a feeling when I raise my hand, I am actually activating a certain spot in my physical brain? No. What we are talking of as the anatomy of this body is totally different from the experience of the physical body. When we are talking of discovering our self, we are discovering our conscious self as we are experiencing the physical body. Therefore, when we experience the physical body, we find that we raise our hand when our attention is in the hand. How do we raise our hand? Raise your hand, the attention, a little bit of our attention flows into the hand, so raise it. Have you noticed that? When we want to walk, it's the attention that we are using. Attention is being used by us without reference to any particular spots in the gray matter of the brain. Therefore, the functioning of the human body as an experience for the self is totally different. 
from the functioning of the human body in textbooks on anatomy. When these mystics come and tell us, go within whatever you think is yourself, they are referring to the self as a physical body as we are experiencing it. Then it makes sense. Because when you say, let us find out where are we located if our reality is consciousness or whatever our reality. Let us say we do not know what our form is. The only thing we know about ourselves is we are awake, conscious, aware, can listen, can act, can respond. We want to respond to this suggestion that where are we operating from in this body. If we truthfully try to figure this out, we will have a spiritual experience today. Just answering this question in an experiential way gives a spiritual mystic experience immediately. Where are we operating from as consciousness in this body? Well, we can examine, are we operating from the tips of the fingers? We are not, because tips of the fingers are conscious. When we touch them, we can feel we are touching, but we feel somewhere else. Looks like when we want to do something deliberately, we use the thought process. We think about it. When we want to say, raise your hand, we think about raising the hand. When we say, do we have fingertips? We think about fingertips. Do we have a foot? Let's look down. We think about looking at the foot. It looks like the repository of information on what we are doing with the body is in the thought process. And the thinking is not going in the fingertips, not going in the feet, not in the legs, nowhere except in the head. It looks like the real motivator of all these activities in the physical body is sitting in the head. People may take five minutes to come to this realization or may take five days or five years or you may even take five lifetimes. This realization that you are as a conscious being in the body operating from a certain point within the head is of great consequence you can close your eyes and you still feel you are there because you are awake. The rest of the feeling, sensations, sitting in the body, hearing, listening, listening to the hum of the machines, all that is going on, creating a world around you, creating the feeling of a body around you, the aches and pains of the body, the weight and feeling of the clothes around the body, all that feeling continues to remind you that you are still surrounded by your body. But if you say, where am I surrounded from, you don't drop to the heart or to the middle of the tummy or to the neck. You are surrounded and you are contemplating this being surrounded from the head. There is no escape from this conclusion if you keep on examining, keep on contemplating. Where am I operating in this physical body from? Where am I? Unless we can establish where am I, the question of who am I doesn't arise. We start from where am I? Because we have only accepted a short definition of the self, consciousness. We are conscious, aware. When we try to locate ourselves in the body, turn our head, twist our body, do anything we like, we ultimately land up with the recognition that it looks like we are somewhere behind the eyes. I would recommend to those who have never done this before, spend time on this, contemplate, Try to appreciate this, understand where am I operating from in this body, irrespective of what my shape is, what my form is, what my color is, who, whether I have light or no light, whether consciousness is a function or no function, where does it operate from in my personal experience with the body? That's the starting point. If we have done that part of the course, you will find by closing the eyes, you can feel you are still behind the eyes. We look out at the world through the eyes and therefore our natural attention operates from behind the eyes. When we want to attend to somebody listen, talking from this side, we could listen to a person without turning our head, we like to turn our head. As if we have to give our attention of the self, of conscious self by movement of this body at the head, that is the head determines 
I am making this clear because one can get into a trap of saying, I feel I am in the heart. My heart chakra contains myself. That's book knowledge. You can get into an energy experience and keep on feeling you are in different parts of the body. That's not your consciousness. Your consciousness from the head is saying, I am in the heart. Go through it. Experientially, personally. You are in the head behind the eyes when you are awake. When you are sleeping, you are in fact in the heart. But we don't want to study what we are when we are in trance or in sleep. We want to find out where we are now. When we are awake, we are behind the eyes. Well, if we close our eyes and we feel we are behind the eyes, even when we open our eyes, we find that we are behind the eyes. We don't change our location by closing or opening the eyes. We are still looking at things with, through the hollows of the eyes. As if all the in information, visual information is coming to us and we are still behind. It's not coming to the surface of the body. It's coming right behind. Sometimes you might like to contemplate how much further back are we? Are we at the back of the head? Sometimes people feel maybe we are too further back. One person was trying to find out. He says, not the surface. I know I can touch my eyelids and know that's not where I am seeing things. I am seeing things from a point behind. Maybe too far behind. There's too much coming in. He knocked himself behind and he thought he was still behind the neck. Some were standing behind. Of course, he was. when he knocked from the back, he found that he was not behind. He was in front. We are obviously in some space here. The more we contemplate and meditate and try to understand in a commonsensical way, not in a cultist way, not in a way of trying to follow what somebody else is saying, but in a spirit of self-realization, in a spirit of self-discovery, in a spirit of scientific investigation of the nature of the self, in a spirit of identifying where do I operate from as consciousness? If you conduct this experiment with yourself, you will come to this conclusion that you operate from a point behind the eyes, sufficiently behind, not to be in the eyes, and sufficiently in the center, that when you knock from the back, you know that's too far behind. So, an approximate position is found along the line of the ears. If you draw a line between the ears and then draw two lines bit, uh, behind the eyes, two eyeballs, and they contact that line, you find there's a benchmark. You are sitting on the center of that benchmark. You can find it out. It's not that you have to sit there. You are sitting there. It is not that you have to presume that you are there. You have to find out that you are there. You don't have to imagine that you have to go there. You are there. There is no way for you to escape being there if you are awake. Being in the human body and being awake means you are there. Try and find out. If you are not there, tell me where you are. Tell yourself where you are. The more you investigate this, the more you find that there is a point. It's almost like putting, if I stretch my hand, make a V like this with my two fingers. And these are the eyeballs. And I put them horizontally. If these are the eyeballs, it's almost like I am as far behind into the head as this distance where the two fingers meet. You can test out for yourself, approximately. Or the ears can be a good example. Or you can draw a triangle between the eyes, draw a triangle, proper triangle. You're probably at the third end of the triangle, third corner. Many ways you can find out, but you have to find out for yourself. You don't have to assume anything. You have to find out as consciousness, where do I operate from? That's the first part of the thing. But I have suggested this to many workshops and people have a hard time doing it. Why? Why should it be hard to find out where we operate from as consciousness? The reason is, when they try to figure out where they are sitting behind the eyes, their thoughts and memories remind them of having to do something tomorrow, that they forgot to do something today, that this is what the book said, this is what we heard last time, isn't this what we thought yesterday? These thoughts stream in, in front of that conscious point and they come in front and go and draw pictures and remind us and distract us. 
distract us even to the point of not letting us remember what we are trying to do. These distractions take our attention away from where we are. It's amazing that we can be so distracted. How could we build up so much distractions in a few years of our life that when we try and sit with our eyes closed, the distractions start immediately. We start remembering so many things. What we have forgotten, we start remembering. So many links, so many attachments. The more we try to find out where are we, the more we remember other things and go out. What is happening when we remember something outside? We remember, oh, I forgot to do this this morning. Or after this workshop closes, I have to do a certain thing. What happens when this kind of a thought comes? Our attention, which is emanating from, coming out from the same point behind the eyes, goes to that spot, to that vision, to that memory, that image, which is connected with that distraction and therefore takes us away from an awareness of where we are operating from. This particular spot behind the eyes, where this triangle converges behind the eyes, is of very great importance for anybody who wants to proceed on the path of spiritual self-realization. This particular spot behind the eyes has been called the third eye. This particular spot behind the eye has been called the center of consciousness. This particular spot has been called the tenth door, referring to the nine apertures on the body, the two eyes, the two nostrils, the mouth, the two ears, the reproductive organs, the rectum, these nine holes, apertures on the body, which are taking our attention away, in contradistinction to that, this spot behind has been called the tenth door, which opens within, and all the other doors open outside. The tenth door, the third eye, the center of consciousness, the center, the kingpin, so many names have been given for that spot, that has been the starting point of a discovery of one's own self. So it's of utmost importance to us to know where that is. We cannot have any idea of any other form of our own self except the physical feeling of ourself unless we can focus in upon our own presence at the third eye center, at the center behind the eyes. So merely sitting in meditation, peering into the darkness in front, closing eyes, singing songs, singing hymns, trying to intoxicate oneself, taking drugs, trying to be high, doesn't lead to any self-realization at all. It can give you novel experiences. It can give you kicks and can give you, put you high, give you strange kind of experience, but no knowledge of the self whatsoever. Experience is something else. The experiencer is something else. But if you can withdraw your attention from this experience, and put it back on trying to know who you are at the third eye center, the knowledge of the self opens up. And then you discover that this particular hollow that we created to accommodate the experience of the body is large enough to hold the entire universe. That this head that we start off by assuming is the only space available in the around that third eye is in fact large enough to hold the entire universe. That only happens if we can put our attention there. Therefore, the secret of good meditation is to be able to withdraw our attention from other things and put it on the point from where it is going out. We are accustomed to giving our attention to things, focusing in on something. Even in meditation, we have a hard time. People say, focus your attention on something and we immediately go out to focus there. We are never used to withdrawing attention. We are used to focusing attention. People have a very hard time, even after understanding meditation, they say, there's a third eye center, let's focus our attention on it. So they close their eyes and look for the center. Where is it? And focus on it. Obviously, they're focusing on something away from them. Therefore, they never withdraw to themselves. Therefore, they never reach the third eye center. You cannot imagine something in front of you and think that is you. Therefore, closing the eyes and focusing on something doesn't mean withdrawing to your own point from where you are focusing. You stop focusing and start withdrawing to your own self. Then you get a realization of your own self. 
Once you do it, it is very simple. People who have been able to withdraw the attention to themselves have wondered why they didn't do it before. And they wondered how simple and easy it was. And they said, why did we struggle so hard? Then they find out that the struggling so hard was the very thing which led them away from the center. Every time we struggle for that, we are trying to figure out another center. I sometimes say in these sessions, imagine that you are sitting behind the eyes. Why do I say that? Because continuously imagining your being in the head makes you forget other things and thereby it's an aid in withdrawing attention. But when people start imagining, they first imagine themselves in a figure, little figure sitting in the head and then they start looking at that. There I am sitting. If you are sitting in front and looking at that, who are you? Who is looking? That's not you. That's an image you made in front of yourself, in front of the third eye center. And where are you? You are exactly from where you are looking at that image. Supposing it happens during meditation, during this experience or experiment, you find that you are looking at yourself. What do you do? Immediately cut the image off and say, where am I looking from? And get back to where you are looking from. When you are sitting in this chair now in the physical body with your eyes open and I say, where are you sitting? You can't see your eyes, you can't see your face. You know where you are sitting on the chair, but you don't see yourself. If you start seeing yourself, then obviously you are sitting behind where you are seeing. The same thing happens inside. If you make an image of yourself and start looking at it, then you are not at the third eye center. That point where you are focusing in is in front of you and not at the third eye center. Therefore, people sit for a long time and they say it's, it's very hard to get that experience of being there because we start imagining a diminutive, a small form of our own self sitting there. Then if you don't want to see a small form and you push back, you say then it becomes formless. It goes into this body. That is true. How can you see the form of your own self? You cannot see the form. Even if you imagine that you are watching that little thing from behind, you can get a feeling of being there, but you cannot have a very accurate feeling of what your form is. Our experience today, our experiment today, will start by trying to understand what is this third eye center, how we can go there, there's the door that opens within, and how can we access it and what are the difficulties in trying to do it so that we can overcome those difficulties. In doing this exercise, it is a convenient aid to treat this body like a house, like a mansion. That this body has many parts. It's easy. You can start by a general flow of attention in the whole body and then withdraw. Or you can take a quick start by thinking this body is like a house. It has various levels, like six floors in a uh, tall building and there's an elevator going down the spine and you can come up on the elevator and get on to the floor that is at the eye level in the head. By doing that exercise, you get a feeling that you are already in the head. When you're in the head, experience where do you operate from and if you have a hard time experiencing that, then imagine you are behind the eyes. Don't imagine that you are seeing yourself behind the eyes. Imagine you are behind the eyes. To make this body feel like a house and to make the withdrawal of attention more rapid, it is good to put the body in such a position that it doesn't have to move around during the exercise. That's comfortable enough, not to so comfortable that you go to sleep and not so uncomfortable that you are thinking of the discomfort all the time. So find a yogic posture, find a posture of experimentation which is comfortable enough not to distract you, uncomfortable enough to keep you awake, upright enough to make the body feel like a home and in that you experiment with your own consciousness and experiment with where am I? And how far back am I in the head? And am I operating from there or am I seeing things? Why am I scattered? Why are these things happening? 
just contemplate this and we'll get back to a review of what has happened. It's easier to close the eyes and do it because then it's easier to figure out or to imagine you are in the head. Though it's not really necessary for meditation to close eyes, but in this particular case, it may be easy to imagine that you are behind the eyes if your eyes are closed. Therefore, keep your body upright, make yourself comfortable, adopt any posture you are used to and imagine you are behind the eyes and in front of you is the dark screen and whatever patterns and figures and lights and images and colors come in front, let them come and go. You are not concerned with what is happening in front. You are concerned in where are you watching the screen from. Concentrate on being this witness of the screen. Close your eyes and begin. Take your time, explore yourself, explore the head, twist and turn in the head, in the body. You can touch your head with the hands if you feel. Be sure where you are operating and then figure out what it is to be behind the eyes at the third eye center. Don't go too forward near the eyelids. Don't go too forward on top of the bridge of the nose. Go backwards. Pull back and see how far you can relax back in the head. Relax into the center of the head. Relax back. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. Open your eyes and look this side. Please raise your hands if you found out where it is. Thank you. Those who could not figure out, please raise your hands. Could not figure out. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Are we quite sure what we are doing? We are not doing any yoga or any uh, hatha yoga or any particular kind of uh, practice with the body. We are merely trying to find out where we operate from as a conscious being in the body very simple commonsensical question we have put to ourselves, we are trying to find out is there a point from which all our attention emanates, where is it? Can we think about it? Can we concentrate on it? Can we visualize it? Can we be there? Can we start with drawing attention to be there? That is all we are doing. The exercise is very simple. Now you find any difficulties? Would you like to mention the difficulties? So we will go over them. Yes. That when I'm trying to concentrate backwards, it, my eyes strain so much that sometimes I get real bad headaches from it, and then I just have to stop. You know, it's it, it's hard to get away from you know your eyes, so to speak. You know, it's like you're inside of them and, and you can't get out of them. You know. <laughs> right. So you understand what it means. It, it's hard to do. It means that we are so much used to looking outside that when we want to even imagine where we are inside, we try to put the pressure and turn these eyes inward. That this physical head and the physical eyes outside are so much taken to be our reality that it is hard even to imagine that we are behind. Okay, what is the answer to that problem? The answer is we are not going to physically see anything. Now, I will give you an example. Can you imagine that instead of sitting there, you are standing by my side? Can you imagine that? Any strain on the eyes? Why not? 
Exactly. You are only ima using imagination. You are still standing here. Can you imagine that you are standing here and looking this side? You can? Any strain on the eyes? Why not? Because you are using only the imagination and not the eyes. Now, practice this and use the same imagination to be behind the eyes and not the physical eyes. It will be easier next time. Practice this, that what is the difference between imagining I am there with no strain on the eyes and imagining I am behind the eyes with strain on the eyes. Why not imagine the same way I am behind the eyes like I imagined I was there. It is that kind of imagination to be used. No physical exertion at all. Let me remind anybody who has similar experience that in this exercise we are dealing with consciousness, with awareness, imagination and not with the physical body and its various physical parts. Therefore, if we can imagine we are there, we can imagine we are sitting somewhere else, in another city. We can imagine we are flying. We can imagine we are lying down right now with no strain on the body at all. Because we say, how can there be strain? It's only imagination. If that is so, we can also imagine we are inside the head. And when we imagine we are inside the head, there should be absolutely no strain on any part of the body, including the eyes and the head. So practice that in the next session. Yes? One other question is, if I do that, I can imagine because there's a, a visual to focus on, <coughs> something that I can concentrate on. When I try to imagine being behind the eyes, there's nothing to see. You have visual screen in front of you. It will come up immediately. When you will imagine the dark screen on which images will start appearing. That's good enough. Just watch the screen. Watch the darkness. Imagine you are sitting in the head watching the darkness. And the darkness will start flowing. Then you will see the next step. Yes? I, I felt like going through a tunnel backwards. Yes. That's natural. Not frightened by it? No. Good. Because when we imagine, imagination is only an aid to withdrawing attention there. The reality comes not by imagining, but by being there. It's not imagination when you are there because you are really there. But imagination is a means to quickly withdraw to that point. It's only an aid. Yes? I didn't, that I moved back, I felt the screen move forward. It's the same thing. Yes, yes. I don't have trouble getting back into that spot and after I've sat there for a few minutes, I realize all of a sudden it comes to me, my mind for the last few minutes has been thinking about some problem of life and not even related to, to that. And then I realize, oh, and I go back to that space. But those times in between being there and then being out of my mind are very brief. With a little practice, you can start putting the mind which is taking you to other things make it start thinking of this thing. The mind thinks of other problems of life. Say, why can't I think of what's going on here? Is it real imagination? Am I imagining? Am I here? This is also thinking. Make the mind imagine about this affair. And then at least momentarily, it will give you an experience of being there. Of course, you will find that this fight with the mind will keep on for quite a while. But eventually, you will succeed. Yes? I study insight meditation. Which they use the breath and concentrating on the breath as a sort of focus point. And from what you're saying, that's really just another way of looking out instead of looking in. That's true. So I, I'm sort of having difficulty with that because that's the kind of practice I've been using. That's true. There's little difficulty when you've been practicing that. So you're, you're saying to just not even think about the breath, just <laughs> exactly. completely ignore that. Exactly. Think of yourself and not the breath. Yes? I'm feeling uh, a certain sign of a veil of fear when I get to <coughs> The fear is because you haven't done it. Do it gradually. And as uh, some experiences will come by being there, the fear will disappear. Let me tell you uh, one, uh, one little thing everybody should know. In fact, I shouldn't hide it from you. That uh, when, when the attention is withdrawn there sufficiently to really feel you are there, we lose consciousness of the body and of the surroundings and it seems to be very much like the experience of death as if we are going and the fear comes 
if it is done under proper guidance and gradually and other experiences replace that darkness which is the initial experience then the fear disappears and once this fear disappears here thereafter in the whole of our physical life there will be no fear of death after that so it's a very good way of overcoming the fear of death in fact this process of withdrawing the attention behind the eyes and becoming unconscious of the body is called dying while living this is the very process which has been called dying while living it is the thing which st paul refers to i die daily it is the thing which which all the mystics have recommended that if you want to have eternal life learn to die while living dying while living is to experience vacating the body to experience vacating consciousness from the so called physical body and finding out who you are really and at a certain point an element of fear does come in but gradually as you see the other side the, uh, the fear disappears and when you can move freely between the two experiences then fear disappears totally so don't worry about it it is natural everybody has had it yes my screen is very bright yes it distracts me i i would prefer a, the screen to be a little darker so that i could concentrate on where i am instead of all brightness it's very bright it's very orange uh don't worry about the color on the screen it is going to become brighter not darker what we are concentrating is not the screen but where we are watching the screen from stay there don't go after the screen now you may find later on that besides the color and the light on the screen the other things that may come to make you move away from the center towards the screen avoid that don't move towards the screen stay back and let the screen light up doesn't matter there's a lot of light you may you may not believe it but i want to share this with you there is more light when you concentrate on the third eye center there's more light on the screen in front of you than you have ever seen in this universe in this world that light is in all of us each one of us can see it and all that is required is just to be there it looks too simple to be true but it is true if thy eye be single thy whole body shall be filled with light have you heard that what does it mean what is single eye if the eye be single why well, you got two eyes it doesn't mean you shut off one eye if the eye be single if you move behind these eyes to the single eye it's been called the single eye the third eye if your attention is concentrated on being at the spot behind the eyes you are filled with the light you have never seen before you will all see it you are all in very good destiny you have done good karma i was explaining yesterday to reach a point where you can have the secret information that right within the physical body by a process of such simple means as imagination one can figure out where one is operating from find the source of this third eye or single eye and be there and see a light and color you have never seen before but that is not all we not i am not recommending that you go within just to see light what could put on more incandescent lamps just to see light i am saying it's not the simple illuminating light light like that that shines like this the light that we see is the light of awareness you will find questions being answered by that light you will find any doubts you have been cleared up and you come to know what's what which is far more important than merely seeing light and color and that's all right there it is too good to be true sometimes i feel but it's true but it's true and you must do it experimentally don't leave it that's a, you heard about it only accept that only believe that what has come to you personally in experience yes john isn't that where the term enlightenment comes from that's right the term enlightenment has been used when the light of knowledge is shed within and things become so clear in fact you will find this light what we call here is a physical gross representation of the light of awareness that comes within because this throws light on physical phenomena if you shut off this light we can't see the physical things when you put on this light we can see physical things where the chairs are where things are lying we can walk through 
and that light illumines the darkness of our own doubts, the darkness of ignorance. We don't know something and we suddenly know it. That's illumination. But the transition from the physical experience to the experience of internal illumination or internal enlightenment carries with it some of these experiences of light which resemble this light and very strong light. It's a cool light. I don't know, how, have any one of you had these experiences before of seeing that the light, this light if it becomes too sharp hurts the eyes and the light within when you are at the third eye center, the light that shines doesn't hurt the eyes. It's sort of cool light but very intense. Even if it is very intense, it still doesn't hurt. It's very strange experience because we are not seeing it with these eyes. If we were to see that light with these eyes, we would get hurt. But that light is being seen by the inner eye which is now looking at the screen. These eyes are shut and the screen is being created in front. The eyes that are looking at the screen are the eyes that can withstand that big light. So don't pray for darkness, but stay back. The more you stay back and don't move forward, the more light you will see. Yes. Uh, you will, it's a good hint to remember that when you get these beautiful experiences, which gives you a lot of peace, joy, a strange kind of feeling of reality, realization, this is it. You find this is in, in me. I found it. When all that comes to you, moving towards it destroys it. Why? Because you are not getting it by moving towards it. You are getting it by being where you are. This is what has caused problem to us in this world that we want to struggle for everything, strive for everything, put an effort. How can we do it? And even now, we have a problem. We think we have to put in an effort to be where we are. How can we put effort in being where we are? So, Although I am calling it do this, do this, try this, actually underlying it I am saying don't do anything, don't do anything, just be where you are. But I can't explain it because we are all used to doing things when we are told to try and do. Otherwise, how can we not try and get anything? The truth is that real effective meditation is the effortless meditation. The effort is what comes in the way. But if I tell people, do effortless meditation, they sit home and they do nothing. They say, we are being effortless now. So, this continuous effort of the mind to keep us outside, this continuous flow of attention created by our attachments, by our desires, which we have built over a period of time, much longer time than we realize. When you go within, you will find how long it has taken for us to create the kind of network in which we are scattering our attention. It's not this lifetime alone. You will discover yourself how long we have been operating in the system that we have entangled ourselves and thoughts come running. Everything is coming, running from outside, taking us outside. Attention, one strand goes here, one strand goes here. Suddenly a thought comes of that. Suddenly a vision comes. Suddenly we want to imagine being there and we are imagining something else in front. We are using the screen for being on the screen instead of watching the screen. This kind of activity is going on because of the patterns we have ourselves laid. And it's natural. Don't get disheartened. Don't feel my case is lost case. I am too scattered. I can't do it. Because once you know what the game is, you can get back to yourself and get the light that is inside. This is not a light that I or any expert planted in you or I'm going to plant in you. It's already there. We are born with it. Each one of us is born with this. Our consciousness carries this light with it. Therefore, when we are not scattering our attention, we get that light. You heard of the laser beam. 30, 40 years ago, people didn't know about laser beam, but some mention was made of it that the real power of the light can only be seen if you concentrate it. Scattered light has no power. And then they just put it in a single beam and it became laser. Attention is like that. When you scatter attention, it has no power. When you gather attention together, it's the most powerful thing you can ever find. Our attention, our consciousness is being scattered through attention. The attention is scattered in various small, small strands. If we pull it back gradually and put the attention together behind the eyes, all the experience that we have ever heard of in spiritual literature comes to be our personal experience. 
and that's what I am suggesting we should try and work out on. Any other question at this time? Yes. Often when I enter a meditative state, I feel a rush off my back to my head, very temporarily, but it doesn't feel particularly good. Um, is that sound familiar to you at all? Is this my own little problem? No, it is a, it's a common problem. It's a common problem and many people have a problem of uh, some sensation in the physical body taking place when we are trying to be there. It is a way of the mind. Remember the mind, the thinking mind is a distractor. Always remember that. The thinking mind is a distractor and tries to focus in on something other than the third eye. And so for a while, it brings up a distraction in the physical body by drawing attention to that. It will be overcome if you continue to practice. I've practiced for many years and I've, other people have interpreted this as kundalini things in different ways. That hasn't particularly made sense to me either. But I know when it happens, it's good because what happens after that usually is good. So it just, it's... It's just a stage in the way. Going too fast, I don't know. Take it easy. Yes. So when people eat meat, they're, uh, they're out of different vibrations than when you meditate, and it's such a difference in the vibration that um, if you feel this, what you experienced. Yes. Uh, there are uh, several reasons for these things. You know the reasons, some of these reasons. I am taking your attention away from those reasons. The, this body, I might briefly mention, this body does not consist only of the experience of our head with other things attached to it. It has several centers of energy. And when we want to concentrate our attention, all the centers of energy are also operating. The centers of energy create different experiences in the body and they are used in our day-to-day -day activities. These centers have been described as the six or the seven chakras or the centers of energy and lie at points behind the eyes and below. The throat, the heart, the navel, the reproductive organs, the rectum, these are considered to be different levels in the physical body where these centers of energy operate. And if you were to concentrate your attention on these centers, you can have experiences of various kinds of of the flow of energy which are different from the experience of realizing oneself. Lot of yogic practices are based upon unleashing or applying these energies from these centers. The, the yoga with the breath is connected with the same centers. Therefore, when you do yoga of these centers, then you get wonderful, strange, subtle experiences of the potential energy that is available in the physical body, again the same physical body that we experience. And people have been practicing, the yogis have been practicing in India for centuries. But this practice of the yoga of different centers has not been accepted by those who want to cross over to reality where the real experience of love exists. I mentioned yesterday that the real spiritual experience is the experience of love. It is never learned. Consciousness per se, supposing you have consciousness or your soul and you are able to somehow for one moment, for one minute, able to divest it from experience of the body, for one moment divest it from the experience of the senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Supposing you say consciousness doesn't want to do any of these things, doesn't want to use the body and divest it for one minute from the process of thinking. I don't want to think, I just want to be. Supposing you are able to achieve these three, shedding off, shedding the experience of the physical body, shedding the experience of the senses, which is called the astral body, shedding the experience of the mind or thinking, which is called the causal body, what would you be left with? Your own self, your own spirit. What would you be experiencing? You will be experiencing what is called love an identification of which there is no equivalence anyway. So the real experience of the soul is love. 
when you want to bridge the gap from these external experiences to love you have to shed these and go over to your own self but when you are practicing yoga of various kinds you get experience of energy not of love the experience of energy of these six centers is totally different from the experience of love which is spiritual so the highest mystics and masters perfect living masters who came and took us to the domain of love of eternity not of a large time which is available in a causal mental state not of different sensory experiences of flying in the skies which is available in the astral or sensory stage not of getting unnecessary large energy over other people or influence over people which is available in the centers below in the energies but they wanted us to cover the bridge to love to real spirituality therefore they said don't go after these things people have gone after these things for centuries give it up it does not contain reality it does not contain the truth do you want just a kick you just want to have experience of new energy or do you want to find who you are and discover the love in you they put a straight question if you want to get out of this cycle a birth rebirth akashic records picking up different cassettes to replay again and again then do all these things which are below the spirit but if you want to get out of it follow the spiritual path the real spiritual path of love which takes you above this takes you even above the mind so what i am sharing with you is how we can follow these high teachings and go to pure spirituality and not merely get a kick here and there which lot of teachers can teach it's very common to be able to put your attention on these centers and i am sharing it with you because i've done it i've been with those yogis who taught me the reversal of the kundalini process who taught me uh, getting the experience of all the six centers below i had a strange training in this because i passed through a phase of doubt like anyone else and i said i, I maybe i just uh, ran into something and i am calling it the teaching of a perfect mystic it may not be perfect something else may be better at least i should explore what is going on so all these things connected with the lower centers give us experience of energy and those come up even when we try to focus on ourselves behind the eyes and some physical experiences you are referring to which are related to the energy vibrations they come automatically but we ignore them and go above them to discover our own self so i have not gone into details of each one of these experiences because it again can distract us but there's a lot of knowledge and information available on what would happen if we were to put our attention on opening up the centers below especially the reversal of the lower two centers which is called the kundalini yes this one of these experiences how many of these experiences that people have here are really from past lives let's say where most of us or some of us have been yogis on paths and stuff like that and we carry these experiences that's true a large number of people and i get that sense and that feeling so many times and i can't even openly share it sometimes that here is somebody who wants to experience the spiritual path and go to pure spirit above this but when they start trying it the experiences of the lower centers come up they don't know why but the fact is they spend so much time on practicing the yoga of those centers but they forgotten when it's coming from past life later on they themselves see their own past and remember why it happened when they make sufficient progress then they find that those distractions of the centers were coming from their own experience as yogis as i said it is a very good karma to be able to come to a point when the seeker in you takes you to seeking the truth and reality and can understand and appreciate this is not real this physical is not real even the sensory is not real it's all taking me out even the mind is not real it's taking me out i must find something that is more real that is using the mind using the senses using the body this particular awareness coming into a seeker is a very great thing that turns the direction of the spiritual seeker to the spiritual path instead of finding 
just little kicks here and there in different kind of mind games, sense games or games of the body energy centers. But uh, we are, uh, we have a past which uh, distracts us again and again, just as we have a present of this life. There are many factors of this life. People have practiced this in this life. There are people sitting here, a number of them, quite a large number of them sitting here today who have even practiced this in this life. And when they start putting their attention on the third eye center, it's hard. They pull down so quickly. It's hard. It's not hard because it is hard. It's hard because of the practice they have done in the past. So these practices come in the way. Uh, there was one yogi I met in the 60s in this country, an American yogi. He took six months of earnest practice to discover that he need not drop below the eye level. Every time he tried to imagine that he was behind the eyes, he would drop to a lower center. So much practice he had done in that. And it didn't occur to him. It was hard for him even to understand that there is a difference. He would close his eyes and feel he was in the center of the body. But he would drop immediately to the lower centers. And the kind of trance-like situation he would get into, he felt he was in the center. But then he would have no experience of the head, no experience of uh, uh, opening up anything except what he had already done in the past. It took six months. So these things can be distractions. But don't get discouraged by these distractions. The other distractions are equally distracting, such as the distraction of uh, our relationships with people. We meet people. We are disappointed by people. We are led on to a certain path by people and then they break that path. We are emotionally disturbed. We want to fight and we have anger. We have unhappiness. Those are also distractions. When we want to sit behind the eyes, all those things distract us the same way. And they are also coming from the past. There is absolutely no reason to fight with certain people that we fight with. There is absolutely no reason to hurt people that we hurt spontaneously without premeditation, with guilt, saying sorry all the time and still hurting. There's no reason for that. It's all coming from the past. So when we take into account all these distractions coming into our life from the past, we are really dealing with quite a big bunch of distractions. But if you keep on your meditation with the bridge of love, it's faster. I will tell you later on, as we go along in the course of this workshop, what are the methods by which you can overcome past karma so that you can cut out as much as you can and make more rapid progress in this path. But right now, I am trying to concentrate on the starting point, on the door that opens. Remember that door that opens to spirituality in a higher direction, in a direction more real than what we are experiencing now. That door is the tenth door behind the eyes at the third eye center, single eye center. It's nowhere else. Unless we can find that way, we can waste our time. Therefore, I am giving so much attention and so much time to the discovery of an experience of being behind the eyes. Any other question? Shall we try again? Are you ready? This time, remember, don't strain yourself. Don't put too much effort. Relax. Relax and try to be where you are. Imagine you are already there. Pure imagination. Pure imagination. Okay, before you close your eyes, let me give you a little demonstration. Raise your hand above you and raise a finger like this. One finger above, just like this, the forefinger, right? Just above your head so you can't see it. Imagine you are sitting on top of the finger. Can you imagine? Imagine you are sitting on top of the finger. Any weight on the finger? No, it's, it's an imagined self. You can move the finger, you are still there? Okay. Did you understand what kind of imagination that is? Use that imagination now to be behind the eyes. No strain at all. If you have still a problem that this is easy, the finger was easy, but imagining in the head is difficult. 
then do another trick to yourself. Imagine you are on the finger and bring the finger down, sitting on it all the while and take it between the eyes with your eyes closed and jump from the finger inside. It's an imagination. What are we actually taking with the finger is not yourself but the attention. Remember what we are operating with is attention. We are trying to withdraw attention to the point from where it went out. When we imagined we were on the finger, the attention is still going from the third eye center to the finger. When we bring it back, we are just withdrawing attention to where we are. So it's an effortless thing. No physical effort should be involved. Now I am saying this, but let me be clear. It is more easily said than done. That even though I am saying it is effortless, in the beginning you may find there is strain on the eyes. In spite of that, they still tend to roll backwards. They still, there is an eye that, the eyes, eyeballs in the normal position when we look outside are, uh, have a certain pressure, a certain pressure in the ball, in the eyeballs that look outward. When we try to look inward, it looks like the eye is pulling back or rolling back. That experience, it looks like that. Actually, it doesn't roll back. But it feels like probably rolling back and putting a strain on the eyes. Little bit of that is inevitable because we are so much used to seeing with physical eyes and then we want to see the screen inside. So, a little bit happens. But the more you make it tied up with the imaginative process and not with the seeing process, the easier it will become. Yes? Are you supposed to see your physical body back there? No. No. <laughs> no. You don't supposed to see the physical body or any body. You are just supposed to be there seeing the darkness in front. Okay? Let's try again. Close your eyes and begin. Relax, no strain. Relax, enough space there. Be in the center, pull back. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, Four, five, open your eyes. Open your eyes, look the side. Open your eyes. Did anybody find it easier than the first one? Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, let me address myself to this question that when we are trying to be there and are thinking about being at the third eye center, at the single eye center behind the eyes, the train of thoughts continues in front of us. Is that an experience we all had? Please raise your hands if you had that experience. So it's everybody's question, see? That's why I said I've answered. The truth is that the mind never stops thinking. The mind never stops thinking whether we are in this body sleeping or awake or in a higher state of consciousness or meditating. The mind never stops thinking. Therefore, the thoughts will come all the time. How have these mystics recommended a solution to this problem? They have said, if the mind keeps on thinking, put an artificial thought into the thought stream. Make it think against its will. And this repetition of an induced thought is called mantra. Have you heard of mantra? What is mantra? Mantra is repetition of words to replace the words of thought. Now you will notice that the mind is constantly thinking in words. It's saying things to us. We sit there and it keeps on telling us something. Well, this is like that, commenting upon it. Even commenting upon what we are doing. We are doing it right or wrong or deep enough or easy enough or what are we going to do next? It's a continuous, very chatty fellow, very chatty companion we have inside and doesn't stop speaking, does blah, blah, blah all the time. You can't stop it. The only thing we can do is force it to speak something 
that it can go on speaking and we get back to thinking what we like. This repetition of a mantra, repetition of words has its own problems. Supposing I, I like ye old Shaky's pizza and I tell the mind to repeat Shaky's pizza all the time. And I am trying to do meditation and goes on saying pizza, pizza, pizza. It will never be here. It will go on to what I am forcing it to think of. So whatever I start inducing the mind to repeat, even by way of a mantra, it will then start thinking of that and not stay here. How do I overcome this problem? The mystics and masters have overcome this problem by giving us words to repeat, not letting us choose our own words. Because all our words have association of ideas with something external, with something created by the mind outside. Therefore, we go to a master, a guru, a teacher and say, will you give me a mantra to repeat? What does he do? He gives us words to repeat which either we don't know have any meaning for us or they mean something which is associated with the very experience of being within that we want to try. So the mantra has this advantage that it is given to us by a teacher and those words do not have an association of ideas for us that take us out but have an association if any which we discover later on connected with the events that happen inside. So a mantra is the answer to the problem which you mentioned. The time when the mind will not interfere with its thoughts will be when we have perfected the repetition of mantra. The mind has a habit to do things repeatedly. The habit of the mind to do things repeatedly, what lures the mind to habitually do things is pleasure. You will notice the mind is following a very set pattern. The mind is a very predictable thing. Though we say, I can't predict my thoughts. If you know the nature of the mind, it's very predictable. The mind will follow the, the path that leads to pleasure. Make something look attractive and pleasurable, the mind will run towards it. After a while, it will give up. It's no longer sufficiently pleasurable. Then it will look for something else that's more pleasurable. If two things come, one is more pleasurable, mind will go towards that. It has certain tendencies. It develops habits. It keeps on doing the thing by habit unless it is taught some other habit. Mind is very predictable. Knowing the nature of the mind, we want to introduce an element of pleasure inside our experience, spiritual experience. So the mind gets attracted towards going there and cultivate a habit of repeating those words habitually so that it keeps busy with its habit and doesn't interfere with our meditation. That is how the mystics teach us. In fact, my master whom we affectionately call the great master, when he explained this, I said, master, you mean you are trying to bribe the mind? that give it some internal pleasure, the mind also likes it. He said, yes, indeed I am. The mind wants all external pleasures, wants to rest upon the senses for its pleasures, wants to seek the senses for pleasure through the physical body. So what happens? The mind using senses and the physical body runs outside all the time in pursuit of pleasure. That's its nature. Unless you can substitute this with a pleasure that is coming to the mind from inside, it will not give up. So the first step is, instead of having this physical body experience, give it a sensory experience which is inside. Once it comes in that direction, then let it have an experience which is mental and not sensory inside. Once that happens, then give it an experience which is spiritual and the mind is left behind and we separate ourselves. The mind has to be controlled by these methods. Sometimes you have to be very, very clever with the mind. You have to be very diplomatic with the mind. People who have done meditation for a long time will realize that the mind plays games with us. The mind, while we are trying to go within, the mind is making every effort to keep us out and convince us that we are doing the right thing. The mind will make you remember things which you never remember. People who are insomnic can't get sleep. You try meditation, they go to sleep. The mind will do everything to stop you from going with it. 
and therefore when you see that our own mind is doing it you get baffled by it why do we get baffled because we do not differentiate between ourselves and our mind we think that's us who else is us when a thought comes to us i think like that is that me who else is there we do not separate between consciousness and mind we think it's the same thing after all the thought comes it has to be a conscious thought the thought is me that's not true very hard to find that very hard to accept it therefore we sometimes have to do an experiment to show who we are and who the mind is in the next experiment we will watch our own minds have you how many of you have watched your own mind at work okay how many have never done this never watched their own minds at work okay now we'll have a chance to watch our minds at work so that we know that that's not us we can watch the mind at work the mind is a very simple phenomenon it's like a computer it functions according to the program and it's its only means of operation is thinking it doesn't operate in any other way it has no choice the only way the mind operates inside is by thought and thought comes only in two forms one is verbal thought when we are taught uh, phonetic symbols which become our language to associate with things what is language language spoken or written language is symbols phonetic or visual symbols with which we associate experiences that are all outside so that language which becomes a spoken language or a written language is the one which is used by the mind the mind speaks when you think do you know you there's a voice speaking in your head every time you think you can hear it every thought that you ever had can be heard inside and every thought that the mind reflects in a typed message can be seen in front mind can then make pictures you want to think of a person the person's face can come and the mind may merely comment upon the face and the face is still there so the mind uses two methods the visual and the audio the spoken method and the spectacle method to think and we it is thinking all the time all the time it is doing this whether we are listening to somebody whether we are reading something whether we are sleeping awake meditating whatever we are doing these two methods which the mind employs to show its presence is what we are going to watch and what are we going to do while the mind is speaking and showing us pictures what is our role what is the spirit doing the soul the self consciousness when the mind thinks out something in our head who are we what are we doing we are the listeners if somebody wants a very easy definition the difference between the mind and the soul the difference is the mind speaks the soul listens always you can remember this so when we are in meditation the listening part of consciousness is the soul the speaking part is the mind of course the mind is also speaking with the consciousness the motivating force of the soul if consciousness withdrawn the mind can't speak it is dead but the fact it draws upon the energy of the consciousness to speak doesn't make it the soul it uses the motive force the consciousness of the soul to speak just like the senses become operative only when we are conscious they all draw upon the source of the spirit of the soul just like this physical body only becomes alive and kicking when there is consciousness or soul if life force is taken out this body is no good if life force or soul is taken out the senses are no good if life force is taken off the mind is no good the life force is still there so in a combination of these the physical body the sensory apparatus and the mental apparatus and the soul powering all these motivating all these the distinction that can be seen is that using the power of the soul the mind is speaking or showing us the spectacles and we are listening or looking at the spectacle we are the witness and the listeners and the mind is the one that is showing and speaking now can you remember this what is the practice to be done now in the next experiment in the next experiment we are going to sit at the third eye center of which you are now gaining some some experience 
establish yourself at the third eye center as best as you can and then listen to your thoughts. Don't think. Don't create your thoughts. Don't start saying, I want to think like this because then you'll again identify with the mind. Just listen, which means let the thoughts come as they will. Just listen. If the thoughts are foolish, absurd, stupid, let them be. This is one of my experiences in, in the sessions. When we come to this stage of making people listen to their own thoughts, they are amazed at the stupidity of their own thoughts. But when they think that they are thinking themselves, they think they are very wise. It's the same thoughts. But when you find that the mind is thinking and not you, it becomes stupid. And similarly, the spectacles make no sense. The kind of images the mind brings in the screen in front of us, when we are merely listening and looking, are so inconsistent, so illogical, and yet the mind takes pride in its logic and consistency. This discovery of the mind's secrets and mind's tricks we can find by an experiment in which at the third eye center we sit and watch the mind. You can't do it anywhere else. That is why it was necessary for me to introduce you to the single eye, the third eye, behind the eyes before you can watch your mind. There is no other place. If you want to watch your mind while sitting here, you are the mind. There is no way to escape. It's knotted out so tight. If you want to watch the mind through a book, you are the mind. If you want to watch the mind by talking to somebody, you are the mind. If you want to exchange notes with somebody and watch the mind, you are the mind. Because in trying to communicate, in trying to converse, in trying to absorb, in trying to understand, in trying to intellectualize, in trying to make it logical, you are using the mind and identifying with the mind. Therefore, there is no way to know what the mind is, except when we can be at our natural seat of consciousness behind the eyes, at the third eye center. Sit there, calmly, coolly, doing nothing, just listening and then seeing what the mind is saying. So go back to the third eye center, the space behind the eyes, the space of wakeful consciousness, not the space in the heart or the center or anywhere else, the space of wakeful consciousness behind the eyes. Sit there, listen, don't say anything. And if the mind keeps on saying, keep on listening, keep on smiling, whatever it says, don't worry what it says, don't guide it, don't direct it, just listen to what it says. And if any pictures come, just look at them and ignore them. You will get back and review it. Close your eyes and begin. Watch your mind at work. Listen and see. Don't think, listen to the thoughts. Don't even reply. Don't start a conversation. Just listen. Stay at the third eye center. Don't move forward. Watch from there. Listen from there. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this way. Open your eyes. Had a good encounter with the mind? Any one of you were able to listen to the mind? Please raise your hands. Thank you. Anybody couldn't listen to the mind? Had a problem in listening? It's not a problem because the mind is speaking all the time. So there could be no problem. The problem could be of disassociating oneself. Did you find, did any one of you find that the mind does not speak in the same voice? Sometimes it takes up a picture of somebody else and starts speaking in that sound. How many had that experience? Good. You will find that it's not easy to trick the mind that now the mind is not speaking because somebody else has come in and started speaking. That's also the mind. The mind can take up any form and speak in that voice, in that sound. In that voice, different voice. So the mind takes up several voices and several sounds of different personalities that it creates. And in addition to that, it has its own voice, which we believe 
is our physical voice. Sometimes you should tape record your uh, spoken physical voice and compare it with the voice in which you think. You may be surprised at the difference. And sometimes you find that the mind employs two slightly different voices to argue with each other. No, this is right. No, this is wrong. Slight edge of difference. Two voices. Yes? Just the mind. Just the mind. Both are just the mind. All roles in this kind of conversation in the head are adopted by the mind. The mind is the only thing in us which creates good and evil, morality, valuation, judgment, distribution into negative and positive, duality. All this is created by the mind. And then the mind sets out to work out and take us in one direction or the other and create hazards and difficulties and safety and escapes. And all the time we say, oh, it was my conscience speaking. Now my uh, now evil side is speaking. Now uh, the devil is now coming to the head. And now God's voice has come into my head. And it's the mind all the time. What are we doing in the meanwhile? We're listening to both. Don't. Forget that there has to be a listener before you can see the mind is functioning. You can't have a thought unless someone is listening to it. And our self, the soul, is the listening post. We are the listeners of the show. How do we go wrong? When we leave that role of being the listener and start actively participating in one of those roles or both and get involved. Do we immediately go into a different kind of life? The moment we identify ourselves with the mind, our life changes. What happens? Worries, fears, troubles, emotions, anger, lust, greed, attachment, ego. They are all the products of identifying with the mind. Did you know it? That non-identification with the mind. Let the mind do what it wills. Just don't become it. If you can be conscious that you are not the mind, and let the mind do what it will, you are relieved from all these. All these problems are coming because of an identification, rather a misidentification with the mind, thinking that is us. The soul is not that. All this is being created by the mind. If the soul is kept as soul as the listener and viewer of this drama, the soul is merely an audience. The soul is just a witness. The soul is watching what's going on. And the soul is above all this. If we did that, there would be no karma. There would be no reincarnation. There would be no rebirth. We get out. So being able to look at the mind at work is good enough to get out of all these problems that we always encounter in this life. Simple enough. It's real enough. You can try it. You practice this. Practice remembering only. Practice of being aware of your being the spirit and not the mind. Watch the mind at work. And you are in no trouble at all. You get involved and become the mind and your troubles start. You have to take sides then. Then you get into all this crisis. All the crisis of handling this problem, handling that problem. All these problems are arising with the mind. Keep the mind busy in something that doesn't distract the soul. When you are accepted by a perfect living master, a teacher, who teaches the path of love? Who teaches us how to escape from this mental game? Escape from this game of coming over and over again and revolving in a merry-go-round and get into something that is more permanent and real and not based upon duality or positive and negative and devil and God and good and bad, but outside of this circle. When you come across such a teacher, and he accepts us. That process is called initiation. When a perfect master initiates us, he gives us a mantra. He gives us certain physical spoken words in order to control the mind from too much distraction, from too much interference with our spiritual path. We should repeat those words according to his instructions so that the mind is kept busy doing that. Our pace of spiritual growth is hastened up a lot. 
we move very fast towards our own reality when we follow the instructions of a mantra given by a teacher and we follow it according to those instructions. So, initiation by a teacher is a great event and I hope you will all have that experience one day of being initiated by a perfect living master. I, I should uh, uh, share this uh, feeling, intuitive, this is one of the most wonderful classes I have been in and very promising spiritual stuff is right here. So, I am not overstating the case by saying that a uh, lot of people here are going to have the experiences that I talk about in the not too distant future and uh, it won't be something that you heard about or read about it happened in India or happened in this country, it happened right here, right happened with us. So, part of that process of course is initiation and uh, being able to cross certain borders and have higher experiences, it's coming. Mind has to be kept busy in this way and the second obstruction is when the mind brings other pictures and starts thinking in those forms and that is overcome by another process which these teachers have used for thousands of years and that is called dhyana. Have you heard of dhyana? Dhyana means contemplation. We contemplate the face of somebody and replace the face that the mind is putting in front and generally what we do is when we have a teacher, we put the face of the master or the guru or the teacher in our mental image and just like we practice the repetition of the words as a mantra, we also practice putting the face of the beloved teacher who has shown us the path of love and thereby replace other faces that the mind is bringing up. Till one gets a mantra or finds a perfect living master or knows what to contemplate on, it is good enough if one can contemplate on a beloved whom one loves now contempor contemporaneously right in the present. If you love somebody, put that face to substitute other faces because love wherever it exists comes from the same spiritual source. Love does not make a distinction that this is divine love, this is uh, uh, other kind of love. Either you have love or you have attachment. Attachment is to be given up and love to be inculcated. The difference between the two is now well known. Love makes you identify with the beloved. Attachment brings you close to the beloved. Attachment gives you experience of two together, love gives you the experience of one, the beloved. Love makes you forget your ego, attachment increases the ego, I love you. Not that uh, love is important or you are important, but I as the person is also important. So, attachments take us away and we call them love. When we have attachments every day with people and have relationships, we call it love, that is not love. When love comes, we forget ourselves. It comes spontaneously by itself. If we have that experience, the beloved is a good image to adopt for meditation purposes. When these things happen and you are able to hold the mind in place and avoid the distraction, the withdrawal of attention to the third eye center makes you forget this physical body. Has anybody had that experience? That you can be unconscious of the physical body if you hold yourself at the third eye center long enough. Good, good. Some of you have had that experience. When that happens, what are you left with? You are unconscious of the physical body, but you are still conscious of being able to see. Is that right? You are still conscious of being able to hear. You can still touch, taste, smell. Do you realize? that even when you are not conscious of this physical body, you can do all these things. In fact, you do it every night when you have a dream. You are unconscious of this body, but you have all the other sensory consciousness. In fact, you do it when you imagine. You can imagine you are coming here to see me, touch this table, smell a rose, eat an imaginary pie and go back and say, yes, I had all the experience in my imagination. Therefore, these sensory experiences are not based upon the physical body. They are based upon our sensory self. That part of the cover upon our consciousness and mind which creates these senses. What is that? We have given <coughs> it a name, just a name, astral body. You heard of this name, astral body? Astral body is not a body really. 
astral body is a description of our senses operating without need of physical body. Therefore, when we have, when we lose the awareness of the physical body, the rest of our self is totally complete still. It consists of our soul, the mind and the senses. It is still functioning, but it has some advantages and some disadvantages too. It has advantages, it can fly. You want to imagine you are in New York, it takes no time. If you want to take the physical body, you have to fly, it takes time. Maybe an hour or two hours, I don't know how long. If you drive, it takes even longer. But if you imagine, you go faster. And if your imagination can give you an entity and a self as real in your experience as you are experiencing the physical body, then you will go very fast. You can go in a second. You can go in a moment. What can make that imagined self or a sensory self as real as the physical self is the amount of attention you give to it. Does it surprise you? Would it surprise you that this physical body is looking your real self, feeling your real self, not because it is your real self, but because you are giving attention to this physical body and thinking this is the real self. Supposing I suggested to you, will you please imagine that you are walking through this aisle, come up, shake my hand and go back. Can you all do it? Just try. Imagine you have left your chairs and come to this table and shake my hand. I'm stretching it out. Touch my hand and go back and sit in your own chair. Have you done it? Those who have done it, raise your hands. You have no problem. You came, walked and went back. You didn't hit against anybody. Yeah, it was very light. No weight problem, no calories. Did you see there was a difference? But that you can say that was imagination. The real self of you was still sitting on the chair. Why does that happen? Because only a small percentage of your attention came on that imaginative experience. The rest of it was still scattered in the physical bodies. Supposing you raise this percentage and go more intensely and imagine more intensely that you are going, that you are not in the chair back and concentrate upon this imaginative exercise. The moment you topple over 51% of your attention, you will be here and not on your chair. In actual experience. You will have, never have an experience that you left your bodies behind. You will feel you actually moved with the body to this place. What does it mean? It means that our so-called association with the physical body, that this is real, is because of the percentage of attention we put into the body. And imagination looks imaginary because of the less percentage of attention. You put 51% or more of your attention into imagination, that becomes real, this becomes unreal. You can try it out. It's very simple. But we don't understand it because we haven't had the opportunity to do it. In meditation, we get a chance of concentrating our attention on ourselves and becoming unaware of the body and yet being awake. The important thing is, when you concentrate your attention at the eye center and not at the heart center or any chakras below, you are still awake, fully awake, more awake. You have not lost awareness of what is going on. When you are fully awake and your attention is totally in control and you walk out with your senses, with your ima imagination, you really fly and you can go wherever you like and you can explore the physical world as much as you can explore any other world. A young, uh, 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 when I was very young, I was very small. I'm telling you personal experience. I normally don't share these personal experiences, but it is relevant because uh, very early in my life, a old lady who was a disciple of the great master, she taught me this simple trick. She said, uh, what do you do at night? I said, oh, I sleep and sometimes I want, I hear some bells and I hear some sounds. I don't know what they come from and I, I'm interested. She said, you should fly. Fly in the sky. I said, how do you fly? She says, when you're hearing those bells and singing, just, just fly. So I said, that should be easy. So when I was hearing bells and the attention was all focused in on where the sound is coming from within, then I would just get up and just fly. It was so easy. And I would fly away. And she was flying too. So I began to check whether this flying is a dream-like experience or is it real flying? 
because when i would stop flying and come back it looked like i was re-entering a body it looked like uh, looked like there was no difference but this is also me and that was also me which is the real me this question came up and i said maybe this is the real me because everybody that i meet most of the time is dealing with this real me this real world this real country this real place i was very young i had never been anywhere outside my own country never flown that far and one day while flying i thought why not fly way out and as a child i had read books on london and the big cities so i decided to fly to london and i didn't know the route too well the direction was known but i knew there used to be planes small planes in those days used to hop and go to london so i chased one of the planes and the plane was flying and i chased it and i went and saw the london of that time and saw the various buildings there and i came back it was almost uh, i think 20 years 15 20 years later that i went in another jumbo jet in the physical body to go and see the same buildings in the same places but one building was missing and i said i sure made some mistake somewhere and i checked up and found the building had been demolished 5 years earlier this was such a strange experience for me that it is not that when you go into a dimension of using your sensory system to operate in the physical world that you are going into another world you are in fact having the same experience but this notion that this physical world can only be visited by being in this physical body is wrong that the sensory system operates independently i also found other interesting things that this physical body thinks it can use senses not because of the organs planted in this body but because of those senses which exist independent of the body which means if the sensory system did not exist with the self this body would not be able to see touch taste or smell when we say we are seeing with these eyes fixed in the head in front and we are looking at things it looks like if we close these eyes we don't see if we open these eyes we see so these eyes must be seeing the truth is the other eyes which can see without the body are seeing even when we are seeing with these eyes and the fact that we are confined to the body and our attention is confined to the body only makes us see so much less strange when we are able to have that experience of getting away from the body and still having sensory experiences we find that we were prisoned in a cage as supposing today somebody puts us in a cage a small metal cage even if it's a golden cage and we are stuck there and we can't move we'd be horrified we'll cry and we have lost our freedom won't we do it we'll feel so constricted we'll feel we lost our freedom we can't move we can't do a thing that's precisely what has happened to us now in this body but we don't take it like a cage because we have forgotten what freedom is what we could do if we were free from this cage this is like a prison this strange experience comes to us when we are able to experience our self not restricted by the physical body how do we do it when we withdraw our attention sufficiently to the third eye center and become unconscious of the body we can walk out and see anything we like anywhere we like don't confuse this experience with the so called out of body experiences from the heart center linked with this silver cord which might snap and make you die don't confuse with that when you have a psychic experience or an energy experience from the chakras which gives you a feeling that you are away from the body it's the same it's still being used through the imaginative process but that is so closely linked with the energy of the physical body that you can't go too far in one of the conferences uh, where many psychics exp- uh, were comparing their notes about out of body experiences i heard horrifying stories one said that uh, he went and tried to go out and the silver cord was behind and it got entangled in the revolving door he didn't know how to get out one lady said she got uh, uh, trapped in the washing machine and didn't know how to get out i am not talking of that kind of experience i am talking of a very simple natural truth 
which we can all find that our sensory system, our ability to see, hear, taste, touch, smell, all these senses that are operating, which seem to be operating through the body, physical body, are in fact operating because of consciousness using a different apparatus. We call it a light body or a astral body or a ethereal body or a non-physical body. You can give it any name. But that is using this body now and making this body function. In other words, when we say we are born in the physical body, what we mean is that that part of our self has now occupied a physical mass and we start having our experiences with this physical mass. When we say we die, this body is left behind and we continue with the rest of the package of the astral body with its mind and soul, all combined. People say the soul comes into the body and goes away. Soul doesn't come into the body and go away. It's the astral body that comes into this body and goes away. Birth is the entry of the astral body into new physical lump and death is the exit of the astral body from this physical lump. And in between, we are tied down by the ropes and the restrictions of the physical system. And therefore, we cry and we howl and we have so much limit, limitation on our freedom in every way. Limitation on the use of our senses because we are in the physical body. This truth, this truth is not philosophical truth. It's experiential. Anybody who has withdrawn attention to the third eye center and had freedom from the physical body, freedom and put attention, sufficient attention into the so-called imaginative self can fly wherever one likes without restriction. There are other many beautiful experiences too. If you want to fly further away than London or New York or India or someplace, you want to fly to the galaxies, uh, want to fly into new dimensions, it's even more beautiful. Some people get so interested, they spend years on the spiritual path exploring this. Sometimes masters have a hard time with people who are very curious. They put a they put a blinder on their eyes. So they don't see too much till they can reach the stage of love and then come back and have these views. But in the stage which we call the astral stage of experience, it has been called astral because of the, uh, the skies that open up since there is no gravity. In the physical body, there is gravity that pulls us, always. Every physical body is affected by gravity and uh, even though we may be weightless in space, we create conditions of gravity to survive in physical systems. But the light body, which is freedom from this body, does not have any gravity. An easy way to imagine it, just for the sake of imagining is, take it like an imaginary body. Supposing you had an imaginary body, would it have any weight? No. Oh, whatever shape you give it, it will have no weight. So one of the characteristics is weightlessness. The second characteristic of the imaginary body is, if you imagine a body, it doesn't matter whether there's darkness or light, you are still there. So the, the astral body or the body that you find your form in, your own form when you see it, other than this physical form, is self-illuminated. It is lighted up. It's called radiant. Why it's called radiant? Because even if you put the lights off, you can still see each other. It is not based upon outside light falling on it before you can see it. Therefore, when you are using the astral eyes after this out-of-body experience and looking at this world, you can see in darkness as well as in light. Because everything will have its own light. It shines. So people who have had that experience see that everything shines up. Even this desk, the table, the glass, the, all the things that are considered physical things here can be seen in their other form. And then other information that you get or knowledge that you get, not information, knowledge, what we were talking of enlightenment, the enlightenment gives us this knowledge. Automatically by being in that state, you find that everything that we have made in this physical world with our will, human endeavor, is actually copy, is being copied from what exists there. There's nothing that we create or invent here which is not already there. When we say this is coming from a world of ideas, people talk of ideas. I had a strange idea and I'm going to put it into practice. 
this idea is automatically even in the physical world coming from that est there is no other place from it where you can draw it so the whole of this creation the whole of this inspiration inspired people people with ideas people creative people they are pulling everything from the same source so when you vacate this body and have that experience you can see the source of all that has happened it is that world that astral world that ethereal world that real world remember that this is just the beginning of the experiment the amount of attention will determine what experience you are having if the amount of attention is more than 51% in the physical body this will continue to be real when the amount of attention in the ethereal astral body is more than 51% that will become real this will become unreal then the amount of attention is withdrawn from the senses which is the next step you don't care for the senses you shut the senses off stay with your thoughts and your consciousness alone even the sensory body disappears and becomes unreal the whole sensory world also becomes merely a copy and then the world of ideas which are abstract in the form of thoughts alone have no visual audio or other sensory forms when you see a world in that form which from there is converted into the astral and physical world that's called we give it a name called causal world causal world mental world supra mental world supra astral world we give different the titles don't matter the point to understand it is it is a non sensory non physical existence and that is the source the cause of all that we are experiencing here therefore it's called causal world too we can have experience of that right by following the same line the same path which is the path go within when we are in this physical body we find a third eye center behind when we are in the astral body where do we find the truth of the causal world in the third eye center of the astral body again the self when we are in the causal body the mind per se with consciousness and we have a strange formless form which is not like the form of this body and we want to find what is our reality what is consciousness where do we put our attention on the third eye center of the causal world so the the uh, the path is always the same go within if you think you are the physical body go within the physical body if you think you are the astral body go within the astral body if you think you are the mind or causal body go within the mind or causal body if you think you are the spirit go within the spirit when you find your own soul and your own spirit as consciousness full of love and you go within that what do you find you find that spirit is only one that's the final step when you find that the spiritual identity of our self which is operating right now is only one single total consciousness it looks split or individuated by an illusion which we call the spiritual body it looks operating in time and space which we call the causal body it looks operating through senses which is called the astral body it looks tied down to matter which is called physical body it's the same single universal total spirit and that's the truth there is only one creator and that creator is what is what we think is our self right now this path to ultimate self realization is possible through the simple teachings of these perfect masters and the teaching is very simple at all times go within at all times go within whatever you consider is yourself whatever is the experience of your own self so what we are trying to do now is get rid of these three covers somehow we want to have the experience of what we are without the physical body what we are without the astral body what we are without the causal body or the mind causal body and mind are the same senses and astral body are the same material physical body and the physical self is the same just we are given different names and different approaches to reach those experiences but make it very simple have a simple understanding of these things and it's much easier to go stage by stage and experience what would be our consciousness if we got rid of these covers how do we get rid of these covers you saw to get rid of the physical cover either we die and then we don't come back and tell anyone what happened because 
There's no communication except in the same form. Or we die while living, which means become unaware of the cover and see what we are still aware of. The meditational practices that I am advocating, the experiments I am suggesting, imagine you are behind the eyes, think you are sitting there, put your attention on that. All these are designed to eventually make you unaware of a cover and be aware of the rest. When you are unaware of the body cover and you are aware of the rest, you will find out what your inner form is. Again, do the same thing and become unaware of the next cover of the senses and you will find out what your real causal form is. Become unaware of the mind and you will found, uh, find out what your soul is. Become unaware of the individuality of the soul and you will find out your own totality and what your reality is. It's as simple a path as this. The difference between the mental self and the spiritual self is immense. The biggest difference, all these are very big things, very big jumps, leaps to go from one level to another is a big leap. Very few people have had that experience in the history of mankind. We hear of some people who have done this. Very few. Yogis who have had Kundalini experience, yogis who have had experience of different sadhana by which you get peace of mind, you can hold the mind, overcome worry, have sedation through meditation. Lots of them exist and have always existed. By the thousands you can find them. Effective practicing yogis. But somebody who has really had a leap, jump into a different dimension of an experience without physical body, at will, they are very few. And those who have gone to the highest realm of a universal mind and can see the Akashic records, all the destinies and find out how this whole world was created, all the universes were created, what is past, present and future, how time can be taken for, taken for a ride instead of your riding on time, how you can go in the past and the future with equal felicity. Very few people have done that. Those are Mahayogis, very few. But those who have transcended the mind, into pure spirituality are even more rare. Therefore, perfect living masters have always been very rare. Once in a while, you find, amongst millions, you may find one. And those persons are the ones who give us the real leap from the bondage of the mind to a timeless state of consciousness of the spirit in which love only pervades. That jump cannot be made. That leap cannot be made from any of these levels to the spiritual except by love. If your sadhana, your method, your path does not include love and devotion, be sure it does not take you to real spirituality. Therefore, love is the bridge that can take you from the mental domain of all these worlds below to the pure spirituality of your own self which lies above. Love is the natural characteristic and the Masters come and they affect us by love. When we are affected by love and devotion, then only we are talking of that spirituality. Till then we are talking of mind games. I am reminding you of all these things because as we go along in this workshop today, we will be distinguishing ourselves from the body, senses and mind and finding out what is left and what will happen. And you will end the workshop by having a feeling of love which is natural to you because the spirit is naturally full of love. This will happen automatically. It does not mean that today you are only physical body. Therefore, you cannot have love till you reach the spiritual. No, you are the physical body with the astral inside, with the causal inside, with the spirit inside at all times. Otherwise, you wouldn't be alive. Therefore, all these experiences, including the experience of spiritual love, is going on all the time, but we block it by use, overuse of the thought process of the mind, overuse of the sensory process which takes us outside, overuse of the physical system which makes only this world real. So we are ourselves shutting out certain experiences that exist now. When a person has got this awareness, supposing a person does this kind of meditation or introspection or self-realization, and finds out the truth of oneself. What happens to that person after that? That person cannot be deluded. 
the person is not taken for a ride by the thoughts and the worries and doubts and fears. The person cannot be uh, uh, tied down to attachments of this world from which he cannot escape. The person becomes free, independent, happy and full of love and radiates that love and shares that love with everybody. That person's whole appearance and presence becomes different because that person just by that awareness, it doesn't mean that he has left the body and is flying somewhere. That person while he is having all the things here and moves and works in our midst, there is a love shining through because of that awareness. So we have a, a great potential by following this path of bridging this gap between mind and spirit through love. We have a potential that while we are here in the physical body, we have the characteristics of the spiritual life of love because the spirit is all the time there. Only we put the right emphasis on the spirit and put the mind, so uh, the senses and the body to work according to our will, the will of the spirit and not that we become slaves and follow what the mind wants to tell us, what the senses want to drag us to, what the body wants us to do. Therefore, it is just a change of roles. We assume control. The spirit, the soul assumes control and everything falls into place and becomes good. This is the spiritual path. It is not something by way of a promise that you will get a heaven one day. You make your heaven right now. The spiritual path converts this very existence, the very destiny we are going through becomes heavenly. We create our heaven upon earth right here when we follow a spiritual path. We don't wait for something. These masters don't come and promise anything. They say, take what you can right now. It's all right here. You don't have to go anywhere. Don't wait for anything. But practice, practice what you are talking about. Don't go into mere repetition of what people have said. Reading of books is good. It gives us information. But mere reading of books is not spirituality. If somebody wanted to go and have a nice vacation on the beaches, Waikiki Beach in Hawaii, Honolulu, and got all the literature, the guidebooks, the air schedules, the air fairs, and found out all the information and kept on reading it, you don't go to Hawaii. You don't have a vacation. You have to board a plane, go there, enjoy the sun sunshine on the Waikiki beach, then you say I've had a vacation. But the mistake we make here is that we hear about that wonderful heaven, the paradise, our real kingdom inside ourselves and instead of going within, we keep on reading, thinking the more we read, we are becoming spiritual. How can you become spiritual merely by reading and repeating the same thing over and over again and not undertaking the journey to the destination? And especially when this destination is not far. This destination of the self is as close as you can imagine. Do you know how close this is? How near this destination is? There is nothing else that we know of which is nearer than this. Anything else we talk of is further away. In fact, we don't have to journey, travel to go to this destination. We have to stop traveling. We are traveling too much with our mind. We are scattering our attention too much. If we stop scattering our attention, and stop this kind of journey, we can be back there. How many of you have a mantra which you can use in an experiment? Please raise your hands if you have. Thank you. Others can please devise a short sentence expressing love for the beloved and use it as a mantra and keep on repeating that. How many of you love somebody whose face you can recall? Good. You recall that face in the next experiment we are going to do. I want you to come quickly to this stage when you find that love and devotion, the feeling of love at the third eye center concentrates your attention much faster than anything else. No amount of effort will equate that. Put yourself in a mode of love and devotion for the beloved. Sit at the same third eye center. Use the mind to repeat the mantra, not to think out anything for you. By habit, repetition, Mechanical repetition, put the mind to do mechanical repetition of words. You wait there, contemplate the beautiful face of the beloved and just sit there at the third eye center and see how you feel. Close your eyes and begin. Contemplate the face of the beloved. 
look at the face the eyes the forehead upper part of the face specially let the mind repeat the words don't think too much don't move from the third eye center stay behind don't move forward smile be cheerful about it nothing serious watching the beloved keep your eyes closed till i count 5 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51 52 53 54 55 56 57 58 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 66 67 68 69 70 71 72 73 74 75 76 77 78 79 80 81 82 83 84 85 86 87 88 89 90 91 92 93 94 95 96 97 98 99 100 101 102 103 104 105 106 107 108 109 110 111 112 113 114 115 116 117 118 119 120 121 122 123 124 125 126 127 128 129 130 131 132 133 134 135 136 137 138 140 150 160 170 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180 180
the future knowledge that it would happen or it wouldn't have happened. I went through a situation, a period of my life, where I would get these uh, normal deja vu feelings. Only I said, well, this time, I'm also somewhat aware of what will happen in the very, very near future. And I think I'll change it. And I might change a few lines of dialogue or move slightly differently or something. I went through a period of time where I was changing what I felt was to happen in what I would feel to be a deja vu type feeling. Of course, after a while, I couldn't experience a spontaneous uh, deja vu after doing that until a few years later. Do you have any comments on that? Time? Yes, this life could be a rerun. <laughs> and uh, the truth is you cannot change too much in a rerun. There was a, a naughty guy in, in college with me, very, very naughty fellow, but you know, he had never seen movies and so on. He was in a village and he came, joined college and I said, have you ever seen a movie? He said, no, he said, people move about on a screen. So he went to see a movie with me. And in that movie, a, a woman takes off her clothes and jumps into a pool. But when she's taking off her clothes, there's a railway track from where these people are watching and a train passes in front, so you can't see the nude woman there. Because the train, by the time the train is gone, she's already in the water. And then the next scene comes. That guy went five times to the movie, hoping one day it'll be late. <laughs> the train will be late. In a rerun, the same things happen. You can't change too much. You feel you could change. The deja vu is coming because each one of our lives has been picked up as a complete cassette as a complete picture, complete role, and we are actually rerunning it. You will find later on when I talked of the causal region and the mental region, at the causal region, consciousness picks up a, a particular life pattern and review of the life pattern is what's happening here. We think we are living. We could have just entered at that point and we quit when we have just reviewed one picture. So the deja vu comes from the fact we've seen it before. That means seeing the future also before. At that level, you can move freely to the future and the past at an amazing speed. You don't have to go at the speed of life. Now we are moving at the speed of life, physical life. But you can move faster than that, jump ahead and see. You'll see a lot of people having experiences where they see one thing, which is seven days ahead in dreams or elsewhere. The most classic case investigated by the uh, parapsychologist was in London, where a woman opened a newspaper in the morning and she saw that her friend Mrs. Jones had passed away. There was an obituary notice at the bottom of the third page or somewhere. She said, oh my God, she was so fine. I met her last night and how could she have died so quickly? And she also noticed that in uh, the notice, Jones, J-O-N-E-S, which was her name, the E was inverted, a printing error, a typing error that in the printing of that paper, the E had been put upside down. The rest was the same. Struck by this uh, sorrow of losing a friend, she was thinking of moving over to her house. She was a neighbor. When another neighbor, Mrs. Brown, came over and said, Mrs. Smith, you look so sad. She said, have you seen the paper? Mrs. Jones passed away last night. She said, don't be stupid. I just had coffee with her. I just coming from her house. She's fine. She says, no, but how could somebody play such a trick? She said, what? Somebody's put this kind of a notice in the paper? She said, yes, see it. And she opened the paper and they could not find that notice. And she kept on seeing. She said, must be another page. I saw it just now. Even the E was inverted. And they traced every inch. And that uh, neighboring Mrs. Brown said, Mrs. Smith, I think we're getting old. We need some rest. You should take some coffee. Sleep today. She said, what do you mean? You think I'm insane? I'm crazy? I saw with my own eyes. But she couldn't prove because it wasn't there in the paper anymore. And she felt so bad about it. Of course, that night, that evening, Mrs. Jones died. And the notice was sent to the paper at that very paper of next day. Had that notice exactly in the place where she saw with the E inverted. What does it mean? The printer's mistake was also known beforehand. Of course, the whole thing is programmed. It's very hard for us to believe that every bit of our life here is predetermined. If we go to the highest level from where it is predetermined. As we come lower down, the free will becomes more and more real. 
when we see in the Akashic record, there is no free will. When we come to the astral region, there is free will. We can interfere with things and change them. When we come to the physical, it's full free will. We are deciding everything for ourselves here. But the fact we think like this and decide is also pre, pre recorded. That we will think like this and make up our mind on these considerations and say we are freely chosen is also pre written totally. So it depends on the level of consciousness how much free will we really have or we don't have. Right here we seem to have full free will. Some people say, which is better, to have free will or not to have free will? Any questions, comments, questions, suggestions? Yes. There was a little confusion about um, the fact of free will versus karma as to whether you have um, no choices at all and you're just following a script and you can't do anything about it or whether you can alter the course along the way somehow. Supposing the script says that at that point you will be required to make a choice and you will be given these options and choices. The script says you have to think hard and argue to yourself and with your friends what choice to make. And the script gives all the details of your discussions with them. And then you will at last heave a sigh of relief that you have taken a decision. And the script says all this. Now when you go through it, do you have free will or no? It appears like you have free will. What else do we know about free will? Except that it appears to be there. <laughs> That's free will. If the script determines, because we don't have access to the script. Supposing we got the script in our pocket, then we have no free will. Because then we can read the script and say, no, I'm not making any decision, it's already made. But supposing I don't have the script with me, and I go through the script the same way, I have free will. What's the difference in the two situations? When you have the script, you lose the knowledge of free will by knowing in advance what you are going to decide by so-called free will, so the free will is not real. If you don't have the script and go through it, the free will is as real as if you really had it. There could be no difference because you will not act differently if you had a choice. So does it mean that the knowledge of the script takes away free will? The answer is yes, unless you are also the script writer. But supposing you are also the script writer and you can change the script, you again get back free will. What is the position here? in our situation, our reality, our ultimate reality, which is the very basis of our existence, is the totality of consciousness, which is otherwise called God, the creator. That is our reality. That reality writes the script, can change the script, can modify the script, can rewrite the script, can do anything. Therefore, that ultimate reality of the self has full free will because it knows what it's doing. Then comes the subservient realities which cover us up like the mental reality. Our mental reality says, I can do it, but I don't know what the script is. I really don't know. I have to make up my mind now. In this reality, which is the human reality, we again get a free will. The first free will of God is because of knowledge. God knows what he's writing. Our free will is because of ignorance. We don't know what he wrote, which means our own real self wrote. So the human free will is arising from ignorance. The divine free will comes from knowledge. The surprising denouement takes place in the spiritual journey when we find both are the same. Then do we have free will or no? As from the highest level of consciousness, I definitely have free will. Highest level we have free will. Lowest level we have free will. In between, we don't. <laughs> that's the truth. In the spiritual journey also, that's what happens. In the, from where we start, the human form, this is, by the way, not the lowest form. We call it the lowest form in terms of the classification we have arbitrarily done of physical, astral, causal, spiritual, total. It's an arbitrary classification. Mind likes it. I am doing this classification because mind likes it. Not because it has anything to do with the uh, importance or unimportance of reality. 
it's quite possible from God's point of view, he might say, I don't think the astral stage, gravity free stage of flying out in the sky is a real good deal. I don't think knowing the universal mind and being able to read everybody's mind and being able to communicate telepathically is a very big deal. I don't think finding out that you are not mind and you are a spirit and you are full of love is a very big deal. I don't think even finding out that you are God is a very big deal. God might say, I think the big deal is that you can be human and pretend to be God. <laughs> that may be the best deal. That you can be human following the script I wrote and you can presume that you are acting out free will. This must be the best deal. Actually, when a comparison is made of our different states, the human being in the physical body, compare this being with other beings, living things, or things which have consciousness. Birds, animals, angels, gods, disembodied spirits, high guiding spirits in the hierarchy, the various rulers of different regions of the higher levels, put all of them together. Trees, plants, every kind of living conscious thing that you can assume, presume, imagine, conceive of, experience, put them all together and compare them. And then say, which is the best out of these? Surprisingly, you will come to the finding that the human being in physical form is the best. Why? With all these problems, mind, entanglements, illusion looking like real, why is the human being probably the best? In fact, uh, in my uh, judgment, it is the best, not probably. It is the best. Why? Because of its kinship, similarity with the ultimate creator. And the greatest similarity is the experience of free will. There's no one else in this whole universe who has that experience except God, the creator, and a human being in physical form. Therefore, it is said that man, which means the human being in physical form, has been made in the image of the creator. There's nothing else that is more in the image, more directly similar to the creator than the human being in physical form. And the thing that distinguishes him is free will. Free will is a very interesting subject. I often... Uh, remember my friend from Harvard, from Boston, he was living in Boston, who used to examine this question of free will. And he used to be member of the Boston Yoga Center. He did many things with those old professors, Timothy Leary, <coughs> Richard Alpert, Baba Ram Das, and the founder of the Boohoo Church, and the experimenters with the drugs in the 60s. Those people, uh, they tried all kinds of ventures into different kind of experiences, finding truth through different experiences, getting a kick out of truth. So it was a lot of kick out of uh, unusual novel experience, but not out of truth, truthly somewhere else. But they tried. And at that time, this particular friend of mine, he made a lot of study and he came to the conclusion, as I've narrated before, that he has no free will. So he came to me one day in Cambridge and he shouted, Eureka! What is it? Eureka? Eureka! 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 I found! Ultimately, I found out that we have no free will. And he found out by a very simple logical deduction. It, it was so simple and obvious that we should have realized long ago. And that was, if there is a God, a creator, who is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, omniscient means all-knowing, who knows our past, present and future. And he already knows what we are going to do tomorrow. We could have no free will. It is very simple. If there is a God and he already knows what we are going to do, how can we have free will? Because what we think we are going to do, he already knows. Therefore, human beings have no free will. He came to a very simple conclusion. But he was very happy with the conclusion. And he came to me, he said, I found out we have no free will at all. All that knowledge which we were being given, limited free will, illusion of free will, some scope of free will to create karma was nonsense. We cannot have free will. If we have free will, there can be no God. He has not shared that freedom with anyone. If he had shared that freedom, he could not be omniscient, could not be all-knowing. 
if he left the choice to any individual, you can make a decision tomorrow what you like, then he doesn't know what the decision is. If he knows, he has given nothing. He's planted the decision in advance. Therefore, there could be no all-knowing God if there is any free will here. And if he has given free will, he has cancelled his own freedom. So that was a very logical thing. So I said, to calm him down, I offered him on a tray a cup of coffee and a cup of tea. And I said, my friend, will you take tea or coffee or neither? Tell me, but don't use your free will because you don't have any. <laughs> and he couldn't answer. I said, now if you say coffee, that means you have choice. If you say tea, you have choice. If you say, I don't want any, you have a choice. After thinking for a little while, he said, I came out with such a big eureka, such a big knowledge. And now you demolished it with a cup of tea and coffee? What is this? <laughs> and I said, the choice is real. Once we are confronted with these options, they are real. Tea, coffee, neither, these three alternatives that stare you in the face today are real and are already demolishing your conclusion that you have no free will. Not only do you have free will, man, you are trapped in free will. You can't get out of it now. Whatever you say will be an exercise of your free will. If you say, I don't want to say anything, it's also out of your free will. In fact, when you came running to me and said, I found out I have no free will, you said it out of your free will. You could have said, I have free will. You could have said, I don't have free will. And you came running to me to exercise your free will. How can you say you have no free will? So he was very confused. He said, all that knowledge and knowledge about God and his will and now my free will, you confused me. And I said, look, I might have confused you by pointing out that you are trapped in free will. But to cheer you up, I should tell you my own conviction, my real conviction. That is the same as your conclusion that we have absolutely no free will. He said, what about the tea and coffee? I said, that is very simple. When you are asked to choose freely between tea and coffee, how do you choose freely? What's the meaning of free choice? Free choice means in your mind, a rumbling starts, a decision making starts, and you start saying, should I take tea or coffee, tea or coffee? You begin to choose between the two and you prefer one over the other. And then you choose. How does that preference take place? The preference takes place by factors already embedded in your memory and subconscious memory of the past, depending upon whether your father, grandfather was a coffee drinker, the genes might have conveyed the preference to you. Or you have lived in the company of tea drinkers and you have acquired that taste. Therefore, the exposure environment of tea drinkers has made you a tea drinker today. The point is, when you choose freely, you are really employing these factors of choice which already exist in your head somewhere. And then you say, I freely choose coffee. But the point is that when you make the choice now, all these factors of choice, whether inherited, inherited hereditary, genetic, or environmental, acquired by company, all the factors of choice that makes you take this decision today are already fixed. You can't change them. Therefore, if I were to feed those factors of choice, those preferences into a computer, before you can decide whether to take tea or coffee, the computer will whisper to me, after all that, he's going to take only coffee. He has no choice. Because his so-called free will operates under factors of choice which guide him only to one course. Therefore, you are tied down and bound by these factors of choice. How are you free? He said, then what determines this? I said, the exposure to environment is determined by the previous environment. Today's cup of tea will be an addition to your tea drinking environment. Yesterday's cup of tea added on to your predisposition to take tea. Go backwards, ultimately you go to the point of birth and your birth determined your genetic preferences. You'd had no choice in choosing where to be born. Therefore, nothing was in your hands. And yet you felt you had free will. What is this game that in fact we have no free will and it looks like we have free will? What is this illusion? The illusion that we have free will and the reality that there is no free will. 
This is a great illusion. This is called the grand illusion. In fact, it's the grandest illusion I have ever come across. There are many illusions. People make you see things which don't exist and so on. People make you imagine you are different than you are. All kinds of illusions we live in every day. But the grandest illusion is that having no free will, we actually feel we have a free will. This grand illusion leads to all the other illusions, such as there is a law of karma, that there is reincarnation, that there is time, that we go over and over again, that this world is a continuum of millions of years and we are in great distress because of this. We have to find a way out. We have to become a spiritual seeker. We have to discover our real home. A wide screen of total creation from the creator down to here. The answer will be, yes, it's still worthwhile. Why? Because apart from creating all these problems of decision making and its repercussions, it also enables you to experience seeking and love. Supposing you lost this free will, you would also lose that. The rewards of seeking and love, the rewards of seeking and love and thereby overcoming loneliness far outweighs the disadvantages that we have talked of earlier. Therefore, when the creator set up the show and provided this loophole, retaining the real free will of writing the script and modifying it when he likes according to his moj, the word we use in India is moj, which means free will, arbitrary, playful free will. That word, one word, moj, translates into a number of English words. You can't have one word. People say it's God's will, but will is too stern, as if he's a very stern God. He's not stern. If you look at life and look at this world, he must be playful. He couldn't be stern all the time. Therefore, this word moj has been translated as arbitrary, free, playful will. That is how he has written the script. And having written it, he has provided the same kind of free will in covered under the illusion of human free will. So the human being, which is also the same power acting from a point of view, begins to be a seeker. And this seeking of the Lord and finding the Lord overcomes loneliness of the Lord. Because people don't want to give any negative connotation to a creator. Because they have already been sufficiently trained by the mind to put everything in good and bad. Everything must be either good or bad. So God must be good. Bad things he couldn't have done. Well, he didn't. He set up somebody else to do it. He said, let the devil do that. I don't want to be responsible for it. But he set up the devil. He made him. He made him as an archangel and threw him down into hell to do his job. The point is, we don't want to look at it like this. We say, God has to be good at all times. Therefore, the adversary has to be found. The mind teaches us to find polarity in everything, including the ultimate creator of the whole show. Therefore, it's very difficult for us to give this attribute to God. But even if we give the best attributes, what is like to be God or to become one with God or to be in his presence or to merge with him? How would you feel if you just became God? You would become full of bliss, full of happiness, full of contentment, full of joy, full of loneliness. People don't add this last sentence. But if there's only one and only one real, how will you avoid that? If God were more than one, then one could understand he has company. But supposing he's only one, and he one alone exists, it's not that uh, he is existing for a time. Supposing the reality is, and we come to this stark reality one day, that ultimately nothing else exists. It's all a shadow play. It's all illusion. The only reality is the existence of a single oneness, one consciousness called God you would start having sympathy for that God. You must be very lonely. Indeed, this creation of the many is a justification of this premise that he must be lonely. And it's a permanent creation. In this creation, not only has he permanently made the drama of the many, he has made the drama of his real nature of love perfect. Because from the vantage point of the free will of illusion of a human being, he has made it possible to seek, to love, to have devotion and ultimately reach one's own fullness and then again start the show all over again and have a continuous show going on. If one looks, once wants to look at perfection in creation, this is perfection. 
I challenge any one of you to sit down one day and examine the nature of this creation and come up with a suggestion to make it more perfect. You'll have a very hard time. All the so-called negativity of this world has to be put there to create the positivity. All the manyness of illusion has to be there to create the lonely, to overcome the loneliness of the one. The whole thing, all the levels of creation to sustain the illusion and yet go to reality stage by stage is necessary to overcome the descent from the oneness into the illusion in which we are placed. When we see a part of this creation, it looks imperfect. When you see the whole of this creation, it is perfect. Nothing could be more perfect. He has done a good job. And the one thing he has uh, used to perfection is the experience of free will. Remember, free will is not so important as the experience of free will. And he has given that only to two. One for himself and one to a human being. Nobody else has it. That is why in the law of karma, we talk of two kind of karma. The karma of action and the karma of reaction. The karma where we can create more karma and the karma where we are paying off previous karma. Except in human life, in every other life, we pay off karma. We are anim animals can't sin, animals can't create karma, animals can't do evil, animals can't be rewarded, animals have to just live up their instinctive rewards. According instinctive punishments, instinctive rewards, instinctive life. It's only the human being who deliberates. He has been given a free will in his mind. He says, should I or should I not? Should I or should I not? Is it high or low? These judgmental uh, deliberations that take place only take place in a physical human being. They don't even take place in a non-physical human being. Supposing a human being rose to a higher level, say to the Akashic record level, the causal level, he could see the whole past, present, future. He would know what he will do by free will. He loses free will and therefore loses this particular benefit. Therefore, this great gift that has been given to the human being, making it next to God, is the gift of the experience of free will. It doesn't matter if it's real or not real. When we do not know the script and we have to make a decision, it's as good as there being no script. It's only when we know there's a script that we destroy our free will. So as human beings, we are not handed down the script. By the time we get the script, we have assumed another role, not a human role. So the system is working beautifully. Right now, it is important to understand that while free will creates karma, free will also creates seeking. When we seek within our heart, we like to seek with intensity. We want to cry for the Lord. We want to welcome Him. We have devotion in our heart. We want to serve Him, appreciate Him, thank Him. These would not be possible if that feeling of free will were not there. So free will in that sense, although an illusion is a very effective aid for spiritual seeking. And that's how we are supposed to use it. I could keep on uh, more and more on the subject of free will. I think this is enough for, for this moment that free will is illusion. It looks real in ignorance. It becomes real in knowledge. And we should use it while we are here and while it while the going is good, which means while the free will is experience is going on, let's use it like that. When we find out later on that what we thought we decided had already been decided, it will make us laugh, not make us cry. Any other question? Yes. I'm wondering about the creative process throughout the morning. And I actually can't even pinpoint a question because there's so many ways to tie it in. I was wondering if you could uh, comment on it in line with our free will, but also in line with what you said about uh, tapping in and the leaving of the body, the dying of the body. What happens when true creation happens through a human being? I could uh, take many approaches, but let me come out with the truth as I see it. Take it or leave it. I am offering you in that spirit because I am going to tell you the truth. If you are ready for it, fine. If you are not, I will tell you again some other time. <laughs> the truth is, consciousness creates what it becomes conscious of. The truth is that consciousness is a creative power by itself. It is not a power that receives or perceives what is created. 
it creates and perceives simultaneously. Therefore, consciousness being the very nature of the creator, of God, he being nothing but total consciousness, whatever out of his free consciousness occurred or is occurring or will occur if there is a time and if there is no time, what will create a time is what gets created. If we become conscious of something or aware of something, that gets created. If we lose that awareness, that gets destroyed. If we remember what was created, the memory remains created. In this room, we are looking at each other and looking at a room and the walls and we presume that there is a Boston, city of Boston outside. The principles of creativity and creation says, there is no city of Boston. What we are seeing is all that is created. The rest is the memory of the city of Boston that has been created and is continuing. That we fill up these different patches in creation by making some things come into awareness and other things disappear. That when we drive a car on the road, the car does not move. The road and all the scenes around us move. That the creator in us never moves, does not belong to any space or time, but all the space and time and the events around are being created as we go along. That creation is nothing but the experience of consciousness. If that is so, then we are the creative spirit at all times when we are conscious. Nothing can be created except by consciousness and through consciousness, which means is this desk created? Yes, if we are conscious of it. If we are not conscious of it, it's not created. If we are conscious of it, is it created external to us? No, it is created within consciousness. From where we feel, it is external to us. One of the very difficult concepts in Eastern philosophy has been to understand the nature of Maya. You ever heard this word Maya? Maya, it's very hard to translate. Maya has been translated as illusion and further translated as that which is unreal but appears to be real. That's not a satisfactory translation. Look at this cup with water in it. I am uh, I'm, uh, taking your position and thinking that you are here and holding this cup. Is this cup real? According to the understanding of Maya, here is a cup in my hand. Is the cup real? Is the water in it real? I just taste it. It tastes good. Is the taste real? The answer is, the cup is not real. The water is not real. The lemon in it is not real. Lime in it is not real. My hand is not real. But the tasting of the water and my holding the cup is real. Do you understand the subtle difference? That the experience of this having happened is real, but things are not real. Now, what is the illusion? Maya is not a reference to the unreality of that. Maya is that this experience which was real and took place in my consciousness, I use it to believe that things were real. And that is Maya. Now, this is a very tough Eastern concept, a very tough philosophy. But that's the truth. The truth is that the only reality is the experience in consciousness. And there are no things. There are no people. There is no matter. There is no ethereal matter. There is no mind. None of these things exist outside of that consciousness. The experience takes place only in consciousness. Therefore, the entire creative process is within consciousness. So consciousness remains whole at all times. The mind has a hard time uh, understanding this, even conceiving and accepting this, that consciousness of God in this instance, because we are presuming there is only one consciousness, which is the only creator. There is no second. The human creator is the same as the ultimate creator. There are no two creators. A human being who creates is in fact the same ultimate creator experiencing the creation through what appears to be a human being. There is only one creator. 
and the whole of creation is within that creator and is just a conscious experience in that creator. But it's very hard for people to understand. In this light, what should we, we should give some name to consciousness. We should give a different name to consciousness. If consciousness itself is percolating within itself and generating experiences, it would look like create, creation of worlds after worlds and universes after universes and time after time. Then we should give some other name to this consciousness. Mystics only tried to give another name. We never tried. Mystics tried to give it a name, give it a, call it by some other word. And they could not find any word. And they called it the word. They couldn't call it anything else. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Heard of that St. John's Gospel? What does it mean? What, what sense does it make? Now, if only one mystic had said, if only one master had said, one could say it is his philosophy. But if all the mystics, all the perfect masters of every culture said the same thing, it means much more than that. Every master said the same thing. And use almost identical translation of this in their own text, whether Sanskrit or Arabic or Persian. And they said, in the beginning, was that audible thing which we call the word. They literally translated it to call it Shabad, to call it Naam, to call it exactly the equivalent of word. Why did they call it word? What else could they call it? I have tried to figure out I should use a better word than word. I tried for years. And I failed. Anybody wants to help me, please help me. In, if I say it's a power, it's not true. It's not a power. A power would belong to someone. Something else would have power. Power could be separated. Power could be used. Power would be an, app, would be an application. But it is consciousness flowing in a creative way. Creating by its own consciousness. What word will you use? It's very difficult to find a word for consciousness that is creative. All right. Then I said maybe we may have consciousness that is not creative. And I found it's not possible. Because when consciousness is not creative, it cannot be conscious. Conscious of what? You can't have consciousness with nothing to be conscious of. It dies. So consciousness has to be creative by its very nature. Then it, <coughs> it becomes more and more difficult to find a word. Why did these mystics and masters choose the word, word, for this creative life stream? Creative living force, creative vital force, creative consciousness, creative awareness that set in motion all experiences for all times, everywhere, in every realm. Why did they use this word, word for it? The reason was they used this word because they found that even at different levels of illusion, it could still be heard. Now that makes sense. If consciousness can be heard, it makes sense to call it word. If it is heard melodiously, it makes sense to call it music, song, melody. But if it is not a song as we understand it, we again go back to word. I mentioned earlier in the morning that the soul in us, which is consciousness, which is the same word, is a listener. What does it listen to? listens to itself. What is itself? Its creative self in the form of all this creation. The creativity of the soul is the word. The creativity of the Lord, of the creator, of the father is the word. The word has made all things. Nothing possibly exists anywhere except by the creativity of that word. Therefore, if you want to understand true creativity, True creativity comes from that consciousness. And therefore we say that word creates everything and word is in everything that has been created. And then we try to explore how is everything being created by the word. And we find if the word means the conscious stream creating for its own consciousness within itself, then anything that comes into consciousness must be created by that consciousness. And you look around, you look at the stones, the mountains, the universes, the clouds, the thoughts, and you find nothing has ever been created 
of which we are not conscious. Nothing. What we are not conscious of has not been created. So creation and consciousness are together. Sometimes we are not aware of it when we are trapped in a time frame, like we are in this physical world. We are in a time frame, so we are not aware of what is happening. Else we are in consciousness. The distinction made between consciousness and awareness is, consciousness is the total potential to be aware. Where awareness is what we are applying now out of consciousness. So we may have limited awareness and a total potential consciousness. And when we talk of attention as the way to go back to truth, it is one little probe that moves in awareness. So imagine Mentally, it is easy to imagine these things. There is a vast ocean, not in space, but in reality, vast ocean of consciousness within which the whole creativity took place. Out of that, we took slices of awareness that constitutes our daily experience in the only time available. You know what time is available? The only time available to awareness is now. Where does the rest of it go? The only time available to awareness is now. Where's the rest? The rest is now experiencing memory. Supposing now does not experience memory, you would have neither past nor future, nor the immediate past, nor this workshop, nor the lecture, nor any words spoken by me. I cannot speak any words unless we have a memory taking place in now recollection of memory taking place in now. Now, which is no time at all. Supposing now, now had one second or one millionth of a second, we could say, well, awareness uses some time. Awareness never uses time. Time is an illusion as subtle and as grand as the illusion that things are being created outside somewhere. Time is one of the greatest illusions created to hang this other illusion on. And once we create that illusion, everything can be fitted into memories of past and memories of our hoping and fearing the future. The hoping and fearing the future is also a memory of what we've just done in the past. It's a very subtle question that we are always living in a timeless now. The timeless now only takes one slice of potential consciousness called awareness. And the whole of creation is bundled into that. If we go into illusion of time, space and take it as real, if we take our individual self as separated from God, this illusion also we take as real. If we start taking all these illusions as real, then creativity becomes different. Then different responsibilities come, then individual roles come, then we become actors on a big stage. There are so many things happening. We have to deal with this reality as we go along with it. It is not possible while we are sitting here either to absorb all this reality of the nature of the word or consciousness and how it created whatever is being created, nor is it possible to make effective use of it at this time. But if we, if we can have an intuitive grasp of it, it's good enough for now. If we can intuitively feel there is some sense that the power of consciousness flowing, which we call the word, can lead us to that point, it's good enough. I said earlier, this power, creative power can be heard. That is why it was called word. How is it heard? How do you hear it? We hear it as a resonance or vibration of the self. When we go in meditation or in these different practices to the third eye center, we are sitting there, the self is sitting there, looking at a screen, may not look at the screen. The self is hearing the voice of the mind, may decide not to hear the voice of the mind. What if the self became self-contained and just wants to be there, then it listens to its own resonance. Its own resonance is very powerful. It shows the existence of consciousness just like the experiencer has its experiences and the experiences manifest in these different forms that we can perceive. The experiencer also manifests in the form of that resonance. 
It's just a way of showing the existence of that consciousness, of the existence of the self. It's a resonance which can be heard. How do we hear it? In practical terms, when we are in the physical body and we put our attention at the third eye center, it can be heard as if music emanating from our self without any external source. There are different kind of sounds, a buzzing sound, a humming sound, and ultimately, the more we concentrate on being at the third eye center, the more it looks like the pealing of a big bell. Any one of you heard that music? Good. When we have this exercise, we'll do it again to see that the more you can be at the third eye center, the music comes spontaneously and automatically. In the beginning, while we are still identifying ourselves with the physical body and thinking there is a hollow head in which we are trying to sit, the music comes in the form of chirping of crickets, of birds, of little bells ringing somewhere in the distance, of an echo, of bell type, of metallic type of echo, of a train moving over a bridge, a waterfall, thunder, various kinds of combination of these sounds can be heard without any external cause for them. But as we concentrate our attention further and be behind the eyes, these sounds begin to roll into a powerful resonance like the sounding of a bell, like the sounding of what they call a conch or a, a, or a bass kind of trumpet and a continuous sound. That sound has no beginning, no end. We don't start it when we're there. We enter into the middle of it always. We find it is always there and we suddenly come close to it. Actually, it is not coming from anywhere outside except our own consciousness. As we go along the path of self-realization to the higher regions, to the higher dimensions, to the higher realizations of our own nature and our own self, the sounds change and become more melodious from our own self. Since it is like a sound, it's a powerful, resonant, melodious, beautiful sound. It has been called word. It has been called the music of the spheres. People have called by different names, but it is that same it's been called Logos. It is something that's not written. Not written, not spoken. It cannot be written or spoken. It's different, but it can be heard. The ultimate path that the perfect living masters taught us was that sitting behind the eyes, using your mantra, controlling the mind is only a temporary preparation. The real journey starts when you can hitch on, latch on to the sound which comes from within. If you want to go within, listen to the sound of the self. And if you can listen to that, there is no going wrong way. You have to go to the ultimate reality. Therefore, the creative power within the self comes through that sound. And sometimes this particular higher yoga of listening to the sound and reaching the highest reality has been called Surt Shabd Yoga. Surt means attention, Shabd means the sound, Yoga means union. You can have union with the truth and reality by putting your attention on the sound within that comes from yourself. So the creative faculties of the human consciousness are immense and different uh, ways of explaining them have been used. I have been very abstract, excuse me for that, but I said, let me share with you how I feel. Take it or leave it. If it has passed over your head, doesn't matter, brush it over. If some part of it is stuck, it may come back to you one day. You see the relevance of what I said today. For the time being, enough that I shared, stick it somewhere if it does, let it go if it doesn't. One day by personal realization and going within, you will see what I said today. Any other question? Any other question of any kind? Now, I mentioned to you that uh, there is this mind in us which creates externalization of our reality. Whatever has been created, it looks external to us because of the mind. The mind adopts a dimension of time and space and puts everything out there, enabling it to draw our attention out into that externalized reality, thereby keeping us away from going with it. Very good job the mind has done. Don't you agree with me? They're an excellent job in putting everything in an external frame so you can always see it out. 
Even when you close your eyes, you can always see in front. If you want to see the lights, you can close your eyes and see them in front of you. If you want to talk to the God, uh, to the Creator, Lord inside you in prayer, you can close your eyes and talk to the Lord there. Sometimes people talk like this and I also look up there. I, I read that God was inside, but they look up somewhere. This externalization of all realities has been achieved by the mind. Therefore, if you ask me my private opinion, what is the real obstacle to our getting spiritual reality? My simple answer is your own mind, no one else. Nobody is coming in your way. You want to go within and find reality, it's a very easy one step. The only obstacle coming in the way is your own mind. Once you accept that, it becomes easy. You only have to deal with one little, little mind and not too far, sitting right in your head. So all you have to do is to tackle this mind. And the mind is the one that is playing games with you. You outwit the mind. Beat the mind at his own game and see if you can overcome it. When you will try to beat the mind, you will find the mind is very clever. The mind puts up a face, a front face with which it operates. And that front face the mind puts up to operate is called ego. Have you heard of this word? Ego. E what is ego? Ego is the practice we have adopted of referring to everything as I, me, mine. That is associated with the self. When we start using these words, I, me, mine, we think we are doing a great job. I am going to do this. Do you know what it means? When you say, I am going to do it, it means I am separate from everybody else. When you say, this car belongs to me, you know what it means? Nothing else belongs to me. If this is mine, it means everything else is not mine. By use of ego, we are not building up an empire or building up an estate or building up a universality. We are becoming less and less. We are segregating and separating ourselves. Therefore, ego is the greatest segregator, is the greatest separator. If we have been separated from our totality, from the Lord, it's because of this I-ness. And the more I-ness we put into it, the less close we are to the Creator. Therefore, how do we pull this I out? It's the I, I am going to do it, comes in the way. The ego is the wall between us and our reality. Believe me, there is no other wall. If you can take this wall of ego out, you have no obstacle. People have tried to find some shortcuts. One person, again from Boston, I remember, a friend of mine, he wrote to me a letter. He said, I have tried very hard, tried every kind of effort to achieve some truth within myself. I failed. I found it is not effort that can give anything. It has to be effortless. Now I'm going to try the effortless method very hard. How can it try effortlessness? You see how we get caught up in the same I again? We want to be effortless. It's again to be the same I. How do we <coughs> overcome this problem of I? I looked around this world, looked around the options available, looked around all the spiritual disciplines that are available. And you can look around too with me. And I found that there was only one thing that takes care of this I, and that is an experience of love. There is no other thing. I found people having experience of success, I is still there. People having experience of endeavor, I is still there. Experience of struggle, I is still there. Experience of disappointment, I is still there. Experience of attachment, I is still there. Experience of seeking, I is still there. Every kind of experience, I is still there. The only experience when the I was temporarily forgotten was when they were in love and they forgot the I and thought of the beloved, and the beloved occupied the space in awareness which was previously occupied by I. You think over it. If this is so, and love is the answer. Love is the real way. Love is the spiritual way. Love is the way that can take the obstacle away from us. Therefore, unless we have an experience of love, we might as well say goodbye to spirituality. The truth is, love alone can create that bridge to go into spirituality, which is now being interrupted by our I, by the ego. If we find any teacher 
any teaching, any method, any way which does not give us the experience of love, we have not yet gone on the spiritual path. If we find a way which makes us feel from inside something of the feeling of love, then we are on the right path. What is it that happens inside to give us the feeling of love? It is the feeling of identifying with another. When you care for somebody, not by saying, I care for you, but you begin to feel you are that person, you are in love. Can we learn love? Is there a way to practice? Generally, the answer is no. Because then again, you get into the ego game. I am going to learn how to love. I know how to love. I went to school, a special school that teach you how to hug your children. There are all kinds of uh, mental games going on. No, you can't love by training like this. But there's one thing you can do. If you do not experience automatically, spontaneously this love, then you can pretend to have the same experience, which should come spontaneously. Spontaneous experience of love comes to us whenever we put our mind aside. I'll give you a suggestion. Try it for a few days. Go out into this world and move in the world without thinking and you'll be in love. Very simple. But since it's very hard not to think, thinking will come back and destroy. Think of some fixed thing and go in this world, you will still experience love. Because love is there automatically. It is spontaneity of consciousness that gives you the experience of love. For someone or the other, you will find. You may find a universal love flowing. You love everybody. You feel so concerned about everybody. This identifying with another is what is a sure sign that you are experiencing that love. If you cannot do it, if the mind is very strong, then one of the Indian mystics suggested, if one cannot have real love and devotion, one should have pretended love and devotion. One gets some feel of it. And eventually one may get the real love. How do you pretend to have love? Pretend to have love by putting yourself in the place of the beloved. Supposing you care for somebody, don't go and be with that person to give a lecture, to give good advice, to give good tips on how to overcome the problem. Just be that person. Now, I'm telling you my own personal, wonderful, miraculous experiences. And I have, I have uh, heard from many of you those miraculous experiences that when you sit with somebody and just be that somebody, don't even talk a single word and you'll have experience of love. And if you talk for hours and hours, you may have no love at all. It's not the speech, the, the spoken communication that gives the feeling of love. It is the identification. Be like that person. Feel within your own self. How would you be if you were the beloved? How would you think? How would you feel? How would you act if you were that person? When you put yourself in place of another person, then you get the kind of experience that love alone can give you. And then you will know what it means to be loved, to love, to have that identification, to, to sometimes forget what's the difference. There are differences. If you start comparing, there are differences. But when you are in love, the differences disappear and the similarities come in such a way you feel identical. That is the nature of love. So it is a good clue to us what kind of experience to expect when we are having love for somebody. And when we have that experience, then remember that kind of experience is necessary in spiritual growth. We cannot have real spiritual growth unless that kind of experience comes to us. So we should practice that love and devotion through these means and see if we can bridge the gap between a mental mind game and the spiritual path which relies upon our real universal consciousness. Let us try and figure out if love and devotion, even the pretense of love and devotion, works to our advantage even when trying to sit at the third eye center. My experience is it works even in focusing ourselves on the third eye center. Let's have another experiment. This time, based purely on love and devotion. Imagine you are pining for love, crying for love, appreciating love for the beloved. Shout out loudly, but not physically, in the mind, at the third eye center. 
first locate yourself at the third eye center and then do what you like like a crazy lover but in love and devotion the feeling if you have concern for somebody becoming that somebody identifying with that somebody looking for that somebody and see how it works close your eyes go to the third eye center behind the eyes and sit in love and devotion for a while 